Hi guys, this is Hirasaki. This story is all about what if Naruto was in Teen Titans. Naruto runs from Kanoha as he tried to escape a past he wishes to forget. When he uses everything he has, he gets sent through space and time and finds himself in Jump City. How will the Titans handle him? Can Naruto finally move on in life? Welcome aboard. Chapter 5 Paying Debts King's Landing Red Keep Throne Room Naruto sat on the Iron Throne. Before him was the court of lords and ladies he had to address every day before dealing with important matters with the small council. Among them was the representatives from House Tyrell in the form of Mace Tyrell, Loras Tyrell, and Marjorie Tyrell. Around them was a swarm Tyrell bannermen, the City Watch, and Kingsguard all there to keep the peace. Among those in the room of curious importance was Sansa Stark, who sat with her handmaidens near Marjorie Tyrell, who glanced over at the Stark girl and gave a polite smile and nod. Sansa had returned it, but still remained on guard against a possible enemy pretending to be a friend. It was no real surprise given her abuse at the hands of Joffrey and his wicked mother Cersei during her stay in King's Landing following her father's execution. All were silent when Naruto had walked into the throne room and continued to be silent after he sat down while looking at everyone in the process with strong conviction-filled eyes. Standing beside him was Tyrion Lannister on his right, his cell sword brawn was standing the steps, and to the left of the king was Varys a little off to the wayside. The master of whispers looking as calm as ever while watching everyone and everything in the room. Sandor Clegane had to be taken to the healers for further treatment due to some of his wounds opening up after the Battle of Blackwater Bay had ended. The hound didn't like it one bit, but Naruto wanted him fully healed and ready for more should it come down to it against another house making a power grab. Not that anyone would, given the stories that would spread far and wide about the Battle of Blackwater Bay. Seven Hells, some were even considering having the area be renamed from Blackwater Bay to Blackfire Bay on account of the dark flame Naruto had unleashed that night, a fire still burning strongly outside for all to see. And many did see it. Many were in awe of it. The Alchemist Guild wished to study the fire, but Naruto had told them that the fire was so hot, it would kill them before they could even get near it. Which was why Naruto wanted everyone to stay clear of the flames by a good 100 feet distance with City Watch around. Naruto wanted to ensure nobody had some crazy idea of rushing toward the fire in an attempt to do something stupid. Today is a day where we celebrate victory and judge the defeated. Where criminals are punished and those who would follow the path of justice are well rewarded. Bring in the criminals, commanded Naruto while two men opened the door and several City Watch members with Sandor Clegane leading them into the room. Namely Stannis Baratheon and Peter Littlefinger Baelish of the Vale. Many gasped and whispered at the sight of both men. Both had looked like the stranger had run his clawed hands through them multiple times over. Peter Baelish of course had been cleaned up a bit to look somewhat presentable, but still looked ragged. Stannis was still badly injured from his time fighting before the Tyrell army flanked and crushed the remaining Baratheon troops. He had his injuries looked at under watchful guard, but the man had been rather resistant to being healed. A few additional bruises to his ribs set the man straight on not being an asshole to the healers. Stannis of House Baratheon and Peter Baelish of the Vale. You two have charged and found guilty of treason against the crown, my father, and myself. Peter Baelish, you are charged with the crimes of betraying and conspiring to murder the hand of the King John Aaron as well as betraying the hand of the King Ned Stark. You are also charged with conspiring to bankrupt the crown, extortion, and conspiracy to commit murder on those of highborn to lowborn descent. Anything to say before I decide your fate former master of coin, said Naruto while Peter just glared at him for a long moment. It wasn't a surprise that Peter was here being judged for his crimes. He did try to escape during the battle after all. It was a desperate and arguably stupid move on his part given his previous conversation with Naruto basically revealed any escape would result in the former master of coin being the most wanted man in Westeros. But Peter Baelish was anything if not determined. All he needed was one of his secret chests filled with gold dug up and make his way to Essos. With his wit, charm, and skill in manipulating events to his liking, Peter could forge a new position of power there. He would live the life of wealth once more and start up his brothels there and make several hundred times more profit there than he did in King's Landing. Essos thrived on brothels, prostitutes, whores, and pleasure slaves. 
Unfortunately, his plan to trick the guards into entering the cell after faking an illness had backfired after he knocked them both down after stabbing them both with a small wooden spike he made from the leg of a nearby footstool he broke it off of. Given his weakened state after being in the black cells for so long, he was only able to injure the two guards. After injuring the guards, Peter had quickly rushed out of his room to escape the black cells during the height of the battle happening outside of the city in the hopes of making it for one of the secret passageways that the infamous Red Keep was rumored to possess. But during his rush to find an escape route out of King's Landing, Peter Baelish had been caught by several other guards, who were instructed by Naruto early on to stay at their post during the invasion no matter what, and as a result he was given a heavy beating for his actions before he was thrown back into another cell. After Naruto found out about the man's attempt to escape again, he had decided enough was enough, and to just put the man down, after revealing Peter's crimes publicly so no one would dare or be able to rally to the man's defense. I regret nothing. I'm glad I betrayed John Aaron and Ned Stark. Honorable fools, who had what they did not deserve nor love like I did. They saw power in their positions as hand of the king and feared to use it like I would. One had the woman I loved and did not truly love her as I did or else the bastard Ned Stark sired would already be dead. If I could do it all over again, I would without hesitation. And I say the same with my other actions. I am an ambitious man. It was the same for my father and his father's father before him. We wanted more for ourselves and each generation vowed to have more than our predecessor until we reached the top. The only way to do it was to cut down our opposition no matter who it was that stood in our way. It didn't matter if it was some lowborn peasant begging for coins, the hand of the king, or even the king himself. My only one true regret in life outside of being unable to marry my love Caitlin Tully, is not killing her husband Ned Stark myself, and with the very dagger I put right to his throat when I betrayed him here in this very room, exclaimed Peter Baelish while many gasped at his words and beliefs. You bastard. My mother trusted you. She once called you a friend. She loved you like a brother. You aren't worthy of anyone's love. Much less hers, exclaimed Sansa suddenly and standing up while Peter glanced at her from his kneeling position to see the girl was crying with angry eyes filled with hate in them. If you are trying to make me feel any regret for my actions Lady Sansa, you are doing so unsuccessfully on your part. As I said, my only regret is not killing Ned Stark myself, said Peter while grinning slightly, but it left when a cold chilling presence from was now directed toward him by the king. And my only regret is not making your death a more violent one. But unlike you Peter Baelish, I am not someone who derives pleasure, though the suffering of others. Braun, take his head off. The sight of it attached to his body is making me nauseous inside, said Naruto coldly with Peter being pinned down while Braun drew his sword. You call yourself a king? At least Ned Stark would have taken my head personally after giving me the sentence of death. Same with your father. If you were half of those men, you would do it yourself. Right here. Right now, exclaimed Peter angrily at him. Stop, commanded Naruto with the brawn just about ready to take his head. Nephew, you don't have to rise to his baiting. You don't have to do the deed yourself like he claims, offered Tyrion while Naruto got off of the iron thorn and drew his sword. No. I don't have to do it. But that doesn't mean the pompous fool isn't correct. I called for his head and if I was any kind of king, I would carry out the sentence with own hand. Only, said Naruto before looking at his sword in thought and sheathing it. Lost your nerve already your grace, asked Peter mockingly with Naruto shaking his head. No. I just felt it was too merciful to slay you with such a wonderful sword. Your blood is not worthy of staining my weapon. I have something else in mind. Something far more painful. Bring me my father's warhammer, commanded Naruto with everyone gasping and Peter Baelish going pale in the face. It took considerable effort to get the warhammer of Robert Baratheon from the royal armory where it was kept preserved in all its splendor. It had been polished and cleaned of course. Any remains of Prince Rhaegar Targaryen's blood were washed away and the only one who knew where they would be from memory was the dead king himself. But for Naruto, lifting it was easy and he had shocked quite a few people by hefting it on his shoulder with one hand. Without any verbal command, Naruto looked at the two guards behind Peter and pointed to him before pointing to the ground. The guards quickly obeyed and forced the former master of coins face to the ground. Naturally, the man tried to resist, but the strength of the men holding him were too much to fight back, 
and all Peter could do was look up from his angle on the ground to stare up at Naruto holding the warhammer in his hands. Please your grace. Spare my life. Show mercy. I can be of use to you. I promise on my love for Caitlin Stark that I will be an honest man and master of coin, pleaded Peter since it only now he realized just the ramification of things while Naruto's eyes just went extremely cold and angry. It was clear Peter had provoked Naruto in an attempt of trying to make the man look like a heartless monster if Naruto killed him in front of others. He thought his words would provoke the king in the hopes his own advisors, namely the imp, and the spider would convince him of an alternative punishment to that of execution. That death was not good enough for him and Naruto would eventually agree. Maybe command Peter to take the black, which the former master of coin would reluctantly but humbly accept, but in truth, he would later on escape during the transfer to the wall and make for Essos on a ship he could somehow acquire using his talents, only for it to backfire and the snake was now begging for his life mere moments before its end. It was your love for Caitlin Stark that set things in motion to have her husband killed by you and your associates in order to pit two houses against each other in a violent war. Do you think I would trust a snake like you with a second chance? Someone who would has betrayed everyone for his own personal ambitions. I would sooner shake the hand of a white walker and embrace one in friendship over sparing your miserable traitorous life little finger, exclaimed Naruto before raised the warhammer over his head and slammed it down on a screaming Peter Baelish's skull. And by all the gods did it feel good to do that. Something tells me Lisa Aaron of the Vale will not take this lying down, thought Tyrion while he glanced at Varys, who was thinking the same thing. Neither had any love for Peter Baelish. They both knew the man was a snake from the moment they both met him. Varys knew the man was trouble the moment Peter became the master of coin and slowly began to bankrupt the crown piece by piece over the years with his ways of manipulating the financial system. Sadly, while Varys knew how to do many things, the understanding of complex math and using numbers to make complex math was not one of them. As much as the spider disliked the master of coin, he could not remove Peter from his position since it would make things even worse for the realm. In fact, Varys wasn't sure this means of removing the former master of coin was a smart move on Naruto's part since it would make relations with the veil strained, and the fact the financial books Peter wrote and still had to be deciphered. Still, given Peter Baelish trying to escape on several different occasions was proving the man was more trouble alive over just being dead. Stannis of House Baratheon, my father's brother. My uncle. I charge you with treason against the crown, kinslaying, and conspiring with a foreign priestess to murder Renly of House Baratheon using magic in the form of a shadow demon. Do you have anything to say in your defense against these charges I just named, said Naruto while Stannis was looking at his brother's warhammer in the young Baratheon's hands before looking at the man himself? I won't make a defense against what I did. I just wanted what I felt was mine. What I felt was denied to me by Robert for all my years of loyal service to him during the rebellions when called upon to serve. When Renly tried to become king and marrying the woman from House Tyrell to gain an army needed to take it, I did what I felt was necessary to claim what was mine by right. Now I see the future of House Baratheon does not exist through me. But through you. I won't regret what I did, nor will I take the black for my crimes. I accept what has to be done and will only say this to you, do your duty as king. Rule better than your father, your uncle, and myself if I was in your place. Be better than all of us, said Stannis, as he saw Naruto nodding with a look of sadness in his eyes. Had you simply joined me over listening to the Red Woman, things would have been different uncle. You chose the wrong side and the wrong path. I do not hate you for it, but I cannot agree with it either. Part of me wishes you would take the black, if only to live, and maybe visit every so often. But you have broken so many laws that even the wall is too good for you and since you have refused it openly, I will put you to death for your crimes," said Naruto with Stannis nodding. You know your duty as man, as a Baratheon, and as the king of the Seven Kingdoms when called upon to do what must be done. Good. My only request to you now is that I meet my end with your sword instead of the warhammer. It would dishonor to Robert and our house if my life were ended by it, said Stannis with Naruto nodding. I agreed, said Naruto grimly before giving the warhammer to Bronn and drawing the Akatsuki from its sheath. I have one final request. Protect my daughter. Your cousin. She is the only good thing in my life I have left. I do not want her to die so young, said Stannis with Naruto nodding. You have my word uncle. 
Give my regards to the gods on the other side, said Naruto with Stannis nodding and bowing his head. I'm ready, whispered Stannis and closed his eyes to accept his end without fear of what awaited him on the other side. Naruto was quick to bring his sword down on the man's head. It was a clean cut and a quick death. You could tell that Stannis died feeling very little pain in his execution. It still didn't make Naruto feel any better, but it had to be done, and in front of everyone here, to show his resolve as king of the Seven Kingdoms. He had to show everyone in this room, who would tell everyone else outside of said room, that King Naruto was a man with conviction, and would not allow anyone from stopping him from doing his duty as king. Now that this issue regarding the fate of those two criminals has been properly resolved, I will now ask the representative of House Tyrell to come forward, and to speak on their behalf. Once the bodies and the blood have been removed of course, said Naruto with a small chuckle leaving the mouths of some people at the joke while those two things were being taken care of by several servants. Your grace, I speak on behalf of my house regarding the events that were set in motion shortly after King Robert, your father, died such a short time ago, said Mace Tyrell, as he walked forward before stopping a respectful distance from the Iron Throne and being mindful of the spots where the two dead bodies had once been, namely the marriage of Marjorie Tyrell to my uncle Renly as well as House Tyrell's aid in defending King's Landing from my uncle Stannis. Seeing as your house came to the crown's defense in its time of need, I will grant you any wish your house desires. Provided of course, it is within my power, and it does not violate the laws of gods and men, said Naruto calmly while he returned to the Iron Throne and sat down in a regal manner befitting a king. Yes, your grace. You see, my daughter Marjorie is a beautiful woman, who never had a chance to consummate her marriage with her husband. As such, in the eyes of gods and men, she is still, pure if you will your grace, replied Mace with a bit of hesitation in his voice while feeling a bit intimidated by the sight of Naruto on the Iron Throne with those two mismatched eyes looking at him with a powerful piercing look. Do you wish me to make their marriage official despite Renly's death, Lord Tyrell? As king, I can talk to the High Septon about making it valid due to the highly extenuating circumstances resulting in his death to prevent it from being official, offered Naruto with Mace quickly shaking his head. No. Ah, uh, no your grace. Thank you for the offer, but that won't be necessary. What I was actually suggesting was something else entirely. After talking things over with the other members of House Tyrell, we were hoping that you would honor us greatly by joining both of our houses together through that of marriage between yourself and Lady Marjorie, replied Mace Tyrell while hoping his request wouldn't offend the king. I see. Well, that is certainly within my power commented Naruto while he looked at Marjorie and he could not deny she was a thing of beauty, a true flower of the reach. Complete with thorns in her own way if handled improperly no doubt. We know it is a lot to ask for your grace, but Lady Marjorie was actually the one who suggested our house come to your aid after hearing of your exploits in King's Landing just prior to defending it from your uncle's invasion, said Mace while Naruto raised an eyebrow at him before looking at the woman beaming with joy at having his attention now. Is this true Lady Marjorie? asked Naruto curiously since he would have thought it was Lady Elena who would have suggested such a move to Mace given she was the brains behind House Tyrell. The fact it was Marjorie, who told her father proved she wasn't some fragile and dainty woman. One who didn't know how to speak her mind like many other ladies seeking to marry into high standing. No. Marjorie had brains as well as beauty and it was clear she got that from Elena, who was nurturing her granddaughter to one day be the future Queen of Thorns. Yes, your grace. It hurt me dearly when Renly died. Being such a great man in his own right. But when I heard of your actions in trying to improve King's Landing during your time as king. Helping the poor, the sick, and the weak when they had nothing to call their own. You avenged Ned Stark and restored his honor by capturing those who conspired against him and John Aaron when they were both hand of the king. After finding out you were willing to fight your uncle for the people here in King's Landing, I knew you were someone special your grace, and I would be honored to be your wife. If you would have me, said Marjorie while smiling at Naruto in a charming fashion that would have made other men blush and stutter uncontrollably. You honor me with your kind words, Lady Marjorie. Your praise speaks for itself on how much you care about me, said Naruto simply while Marjorie smiled further. I merely speak the truth your grace, replied Marjorie while Naruto smiled further. Again, you honor me. However, while I would no doubt be honored in being married to such a kind, smart, and clearly beautiful woman, for the moment I must say no to your offer of marriage, said Naruto while seeing the shock of the people in the room and even Tyrion looked at him like he had gone mad. 
Your grace, asked Mace while wondering what he or his house had done to make the man say no to Marjorie in the first place when Naruto raised his hand for silence. Hold on. Let me finish. I said no to marriage, but only for a time. What I would prefer to do instead is to court Lady Marjorie first before anything proceeds to the next level. My own father and mother had an arranged marriage following his ascension to the Iron Throne. As did Ned Stark and Caitlin Tully in their youth. Between the two in this type of situation, only how Stark succeeded in producing a lasting and loving marriage that continued for many years while having many children as a result of it. In many ways, an arranged marriage is like a coin toss. It can turn out to be very bad or it can turn out to be very good. Still, I will not risk the happiness of Marjorie Tyrell or the overall happiness of House Tyrell as a whole through such things. So, I propose an alternative to the offer of an arranged marriage, where in the end, everyone wins without the risk of both sides feeling only unhappiness or possible bitterness, said Naruto while Marjorie let out the air trapped in her lungs after hearing she wasn't out of the running to be his future wife and queen just yet. What alternative your grace? asked Mace curiously. As I mentioned earlier, I would be willing to court Lady Marjorie while she is staying here in King's Landing. We will get to know each other. Our likes, dislikes, hobbies, and try to form the needed bond a man and woman have with each other before considering the idea of marriage. After an unknown amount of time, if both of us feel that sensation of love one feels and wish to marry, we shall. If for some reason, we do not create such a feeling, we will end the courtship in a civil and respectful manner worthy of both our houses and our stations, answered Naruto with Mace looking at Marjorie and Loras for a long second before turning to face the king. That would be most acceptable your grace. After all, no one wants to be in a loveless marriage, and rushing into it so soon would risk such an event happening, said Mace before he bowed humbly to the king. Agreed Lord Tyrell. I trust you are not offended by the alternative Lady Marjorie? I did not want you to be put in the same cruel position as my parents had been with their own arranged marriage and find there was no love where there should be from the start, said Naruto while Marjorie shook her head. If anything, your grace, the alternative makes my feelings for you and my heartbeat even stronger. You wish to be considerate about my feelings and getting to know me over just accepting the marriage, said Marjorie while Naruto smiled. I will arrange for you to stay in the Red Keep and if Lord Tyrell wishes, I can have him become a member of the small council. Perhaps as the master of law, offered Naruto while Mace Tyrell looked shocked, but still willing to accept the position. I would be honored your grace, replied Mace, before humbly bowing again. Good. My hand will assist you with anything you might require to prepare for the next small council meeting which will be held later a few days from now when things are truly settled. In the meantime, I have other kingly matters to attend to before that time, said Naruto before dismissing court and went to his office. Lannister Army Encampment Some time later. Tywin Lannister was not pleased. Even more so with the end result of what happened with Naruto and Stannis fighting it out over King's Landing. His scouts had kept a safe distance from the city, but observed the battle all the same and their report was not what he expected. Of course, Tywin made sure what they said to him was the absolute truth, and what they told him was not some ramblings of a bunch of drunks prior to their crucial assignment. Still, what they told him after swearing it before the old gods and the new didn't amuse him in the slightest. His oldest grandson currently sitting on the Iron Throne had for all intensive purposes, executed a brilliant strategy against Stannis and his much larger army. With the help of Tyrion, who Tywin still didn't believe was useful to Naruto as Hand of the King, and Varys, by providing wildfire, Stannis suffered significant losses before the Tyrells swooped into the battle near the end to fight for House Baratheon. They even reported the Hound himself was fighting beside Naruto in battle, which was sort of a surprise for Tywin in itself since it was well known that all members of House Clegane usually fought for House Lannister. Of course, Sandor Clegane was not one to shy away from a battle in any sense, just like his big brother Gregor and was merely fighting to sate his bloodlust. There was also the issue of Lannister men under Cersei's command attacking Sandor Clegane to free Joffrey and herself from Naruto's order of confinement to the Red Keep. As a result, the Hound decided it was better to serve the king over that of anyone from House Lannister, and while Naruto was a Lannister on his mother's side, he doubted the Hound saw the man as such. But back to the issue of his scouts, Tywin did not anticipate Stannis losing, and in such a spectacular fashion, no less. Wildfire used to sink a large chunk of Stannis's fleet, using the shore to bottleneck the invading army before they could advance, and if the scouts were indeed accurate in their accounts, magic of all things being used by Naruto himself. 
unleashing an invisible force with a raise of his hand. Not to mention his scouts had even reported a dark fire manifesting itself and consuming most of Stannis's army in that very violent moment. When his men reported these things to Tywin, the great lion of House Lannister suspected his men were either intoxicated or had taken some kind of strong hallucinogenic drug designed to mess with one's senses. But one look at his fear-filled men, looking them right in the eyes in usual Tywin Lannister fashion, and he saw these men were telling the truth. Hard to imagine given what they reported to him. By the seven hells, Tywin wouldn't be sure to believe it himself. Not even if his own brother Kevin had seen it and told him the report was true. Sadly, Tywin nor his brother had seen it with their own eyes so it was difficult to accept such a report was true since magical powers wasn't exactly something one found recorded as part of their bloodline. In fact, Tywin didn't think anyone from his bloodline possessed such magical power from the founding of his house. Of course, such power could have come from Robert's side of the family through his Targaryen lineage if all of the stories of dragons and magic being connected were somewhat accurate. It was said when the last dragon died, all the magic the world possessed died out with them and changed the landscape significantly. Speaking of the fallen house, he had some recent reports of the Targaryen girl struggling to survive in Essos with what remained of her broken Khalasar following her husband, Khal Drogo's death. At the moment, she was somewhere near Astapor, and rumored to be interested in the Unsullied. Which unfortunate for the Targaryen woman since a slave army was expensive and she had no gold to trade with for them. In addition, Tywin didn't really care about the young upstart Targaryen woman, who was now the last of the Mad King's children, and real remaining lineage with a right to claim the Iron Throne if she married some High Lord's son. What Tywin Lannister cared about was his legacy and how they had fucked it up so far up the ass, it wasn't even funny. Cersei was in Lannisport with Joffrey, fucking up the ability to manage the city so badly, Tywin had to send several thousand of his troops, plus his brother back to the city to keep the people from rebelling, or at the very least prevent any further fuck-ups from his grandson. Even worse, he had gotten reports from his agents elsewhere that the North was successfully repelling the Greyjoy invasion fleet, and Winterfell had been properly defended by everyone around it. Every able man had taken up the sword to protect the North, Winterfell, and the two young Stark boys who were running the castle with the aid of their maester along with the trusty Winterfell master at arms Sir Roderick Castle, and had done an amazing job in the process. Tywin was a bit envious at how the North had fought with such zeal to repel such an invasion and protect what was left of House Stark in Winterfell. The Greyjoy fleet had been totally annihilated to a fraction of what was sent against the Northern forces. With the defenses fortified by troops sent by Rob Stark to defend it, not only were the Ironborn defeated, but the North had successfully captured Theon Greyjoy too. Even now, word had reached Tywin of the Greyjoy being thrown in the dungeons of Winterfell under watchful eyes, and readied swords should they be needed. It would seem Theon would be shown the true pleasantries of the North provided that the Honorable Ned Stark did not have the heart to show on him when the Greyjoy was a child. Tywin had frowned at the news since he was hoping the North would lose a great deal of men and supplies had the Greyjoy fleet succeeded in their invasion. Though how Rob Stark knew to send some of his army back to the north after sending Theon Greyjoy to the Iron Islands was a mystery to him. The plan to seek alliance was an old strategy. As old as war itself. But the true genius behind the strategy was seeking allies who would not betray you or those who would see such an attempt at an alliance as a weakness and would seek to exploit it. Tywin would admit it, if only to himself, that Rob Stark had the right idea but chose the wrong potential ally in the overall attempt. Dorne would have been a better attempt for the young wolf in seeking an alliance if not for the distance between the north and the southern regions where Dorne resided. Plus, there was the fact Prince Doran was not one to do anything hasty, and most likely would have politely declined such a thing. Even if it meant getting a shot at House Lannister or the mountain if the opportunity presented itself. But Prince Doran was not an opportunist like Balon Greyjoy was when he saw an opening too good to resist. But Balon Greyjoy was also an old spiteful man. He lost most of his sons in the last war and one was held hostage by the Starks to keep the Ironborn from going about their old pillaging ways. To have his remaining son returned and seen as a man he did not accept as an Ironborn, but as a mainlander as all Ironborn called people, it must have really upset the old Kraken King something fierce. Had the Starks not been key in crushing House Greyjoy with House Baratheon and the other major houses in the process, Balon might have considered it. But the Ironborn had a long and proud history of doing everything without the aid of others. 
Many houses had united against and crushed said ironborn pride practically into nothing when the Greyjoys had tried their hand at plundering and making others pay the iron price as they called it. They clearly saw this as an opportunity to regain their lost pride and take the pride of all those who took it from them in the first place all those years ago. Too bad for the ironborn that most of them were as stupid as they were prideful. Most of them didn't even know how to spell their own names. Most didn't even know how to read or write. You could write on a piece of parchment all ironborn are cunts and convince an illiterate member of the group that it said something else entirely. When it came to the ability to speak, they just listened to other people talking and mimicked them in secret to talk like a normal person until their practice paid off. Tywin Lannister no doubt knew that Balon was fuming mad at the loss of his forces by a well-prepared north over the near-empty land he assumed would be needing his fleet. Being denied what he believed was his one chance at regaining the former glory of House Greyjoy and the Ironborn way no doubt aided what pride the man had left. The arrogant and prideful fool. Still, it puzzles me that Rob Stark had the mindset to send troops back to the north to defend it against the Greyjoys. Could he have had help? While Rob Stark is no doubt a good commander, he is not what one would call a brilliant tactician either, and I do not believe he sought his move biting him in the ass. So how? How did he know to react against House Greyjoy? And at the last possible moment? Wait. Could, could the spider or the king himself have warned him, thought Tywin with a frown on his face while thinking over the revelation in his mind. It wasn't an impossible theory to consider at this point. The spider usually didn't take one side or another in any conflict. Not openly at any rate. He was someone who only spun his webs and used his little birds to defend the realm as a whole from annihilation or pure utter chaos. But still, if the new king gave him an order, Tywin knew the spider would obey. Varys was duty bound to obey the king, even if he disagreed with the decision the king made. If the spider was ordered to send a message to Rob Stark about the threat of the Greyjoy fleet possibly attacking based on old slights, there was a good chance the young wolf would heed such a warning if the message had a most convincing argument written down on it. By why? Why aid the North? Neither the young wolf or the young stag knew of the other during their time growing up in different places. Could it be some form of honor-bound duty between two great houses? As Ned Stark and Robert Baratheon were brothers in life, did the king wish to continue such a bond with Rob Stark and keep it alive for the next generation? And if so, what did such a bond mean for House Lannister? Could it be broken? Twisted? Used in some way to benefit Tywin since the boy was descended from his bloodline just as much as he was Robert's own? Surely Naruto understood how family came first above all things. Jaime was still a prisoner of the Northern Army. Under even heavier guard from what he had learned thanks to Caitlin Stark returning to the camp with one Brienne of Tarth. A rather large woman who rivaled the Hound in height and knew from reputation in being incredibly strong. A messenger sent to the Stark encampment had been thrown into the same pen of sorts with Jaime and both were caught conspiring on how to break out by Brienne of Tarth when she somehow overheard the conversation. From what the loyal messenger had told Tywin upon his return to the Lannister camp, the large and incredibly strong woman instantly came into the pen and separated the two before they could do anything that would help Jaime in his escape. Which was a shame since Tywin was sure Jaime would have easily used the boy to his advantage somehow and escaped from the Stark bannermen with ease while killing a few of them. Lord Tywin. Lord Tywin. I have a message for you, exclaimed a runner who rushed into the tent and presented a rolled up parchment with a seal on it. From who? asked Tywin before he saw the seal and scowled. From House Baratheon. From the King of Westeros my lord. For your eyes only from what I was told, answered the runner after he caught his breath. Leave me, commanded Tywin while the runner bowed quickly and left to be elsewhere when the Lord of House Lannister read the message. Dear Lord Tywin of House Lannister. I write to you now because my short time as king has been busy as you no doubt have heard with my own issues regarding my uncle Stannis. I'm sure you also heard about the recent battle at Blackwater Bay where my uncle tried to invade King's Landing and sack the city to claim the Iron Throne from me. Given how I am writing to you and he is not, it is pretty obvious you know who is the victor of that particular battle. But that is neither here nor there my grandfather, for I am writing for you to call for an end to this war with House Stark. Yes, you heard me. There must be peace between your houses, as this war has been costly toward the small folk and the realm of men as a whole. 
It is costly, it is unjust, and despite what you may believe grandfather, your side is in the wrong. Yes, you heard me again. Your side is in the wrong. How do I know this? Varus and his little birds tell him things and he tells me things in return. Now before you think Varus won't tell me everything, no I made it very clear to the spider that should he withhold anything I need to know in order to protect the seven kingdoms, I will make it my personal mission to slowly destroy his very being, and do it in a way that would scare even the mountain. As to the reason I stated earlier of your fight with House Stark being unjust, I am telling you it is simply because it is true. This war with the Starks has escalated beyond a petty dispute between a woman, who is your daughter, and the late hand of the King Ned Stark himself. This action spiraled out of control because your daughter, my mother, and my brother all chose to pick a fight with Ned Stark. A fight which allowed certain people like Littlefinger to exploit to his advantage. Yes, you heard me. Littlefinger helped exploit your house, its wealth, and put House Stark in position to stain your armor bloody. In fact, the whole issue between House Stark and House Lannister was set into motion around the time of John Arryn's death. Your successor as Hand of the King when my father came to power as king and tried to hold the Seven Kingdoms together. Given John Arryn's age and my father's vices being what they were, he did remarkably well as Hand of the King. You two could have compared notes if he were still alive. But I digress. The point is grandfather that House Lannister has done several wrongs by House Stark since my father died from the boar gutting him on his fucking hunting trip. Namely, the most mentionable one being Joffrey going back on his word and having Ned Stark take the black upon confessing his crimes in front of the Great September of Baylor and killing him, but torturing the man's poor innocent daughter in the throne. Almost using a crossbow on the girl and threatening to use her as target practice if not for the fact they were to be married. You can thank Uncle Tyrion for stepping in and stopping her abuse, which the news of it no doubt would have reached Robb Stark and driven him further to kick your ass. It is well documented he's won every single battle against you so don't think that I'm being overdramatic. By the way, I nullified that little marriage agreement between Sansa Stark and Joffrey so don't bother trying to convince me otherwise. Besides, if I told you half the shit Joffrey did before I came along, you would want to kill him too if not for the fact he is your grandson and I don't see you as a kinslayer. But again, I digress on the issue. My mother, who is your daughter, has done some serious crimes herself. For the sake of protecting some form of House Lannister's reputation, should this message somehow be intercepted by a third party, I will not write them down. But, to clarify some things, I'm sure you have heard about some of the crimes through Stannis's sending his own message throughout the Seven Kingdoms? Again, I won't write them down, but needless to say, what Stannis wrote is true. Varys along with my own investigations, plus knowledge I acquired during my travels in the study of the human body, helped reveal certain things. If you doubt me grandfather, I want you to really take a look at Joffrey the next time you see him. Really look at him. His facial features. Namely his hair, his eye color, and even his face overall before you consult with a trusted maester about bloodline characteristics. Also, if you have some form of an updated tomb listing all the bloodline features of all the great houses of Westeros, my advice to you is to read it, and I mean really read it. Namely, all of the Baratheons from Robert's bloodline prior to Joffrey. If you still don't believe me after that, I would suggest you confront your daughter on the issue, and I would you do it in a way she cannot lie. My advice is to question Lancel about her and the things she's done first. Varys has been quite informative of his crimes too, and they intertwine with mothers. At the same time, to show I am not taking one side over the other, I will try to convince House Stark to release Uncle Jamie into my custody and hold him for a time until you can come to King's Landing yourself with a small, no more than five men, escort to get this whole issue resolved. I may be a Baratheon on my father's side of the family, but I am also a Lannister on mother's side, and while I am ashamed of it because of her past actions against me, I also believe family should come first. Jamie is my uncle just as much as Tyrion is so I cannot turn my back on him, even if the man is an arrogant shit, and we both know it's true. Don't bother denying it. In any case, don't bother to look for aid with any other major house like Rob Stark did since no one will back you. Not even the Greyjoys. Hell, they would sooner turn on you and sack the Westernlands like they tried with the North if not for the fact they have just recently suffered heavy losses. House Tyrell is already in King's Landing backing me with their people with everything they've got. Dorne has no love for you and I am on good speaking terms with Prince Oberyn himself from my days in the fighting pits when we fought each other. While Marcella is currently in an arranged marriage now with Prince Doran's son and heir, 
it doesn't mean they will back your house in the future if asked. Besides, the family still wants your head, and the head of the mountain for what you ordered your mad dog to do to their sister. Tyrion may have started the healing process between your two houses, but the scar you left on them and their house with the aid of the mountain will take a long time to heal. Again, don't bother denying it. Speaking of Tyrion, I don't know why you think so lowly of him grandfather. Since being made my permanent hand of the king, my uncle has done a remarkable job here. With his help in Varys, King's Landing has been slowly turning itself around, and I am quite proud of him. He even helped in defending King's Landing using his skilled mind and his love for reading books connected to important subjects when required to look them up. And before you think little of him again, no Tyrion has cut back on the whoring aspect of his life. He still drinks wine of course, but now in healthy moderation and not during work or during small council meetings since it would only curb his mental faculties. I have also made him the master of coin, but on a temporary level until a suitable and qualified replacement for Peter Baelish long-term can be discovered. As a Lannister, he knows a great deal about money and about wealth in general. Not surprising after all, given he has been surrounded by it all his life and knows how to spend it properly. As you know, the crown owes you three million in debt, give or take a few thousand. But what you probably don't know is the crown also owes three million to the Iron Bank and had I not taken the throne from Joffrey, the debt would have fallen on him to pay the grand total of six million gold dragons. I know you are rich grandfather, but I doubt you would wish to help Joffrey or Cersei pay the Iron Bank what they are owed out of your share. In any case, I'm taking measures to pay back the debts owed and getting the crown's finances back in the black. I expect a response from you within the week. I hope it is the correct one. Failure to give me a response will be seen as an automatic no, an insult, and you will be labeled a traitor to the crown along with all of your bannermen who support your action. Naruto of House Baratheon and King of the Seven Kingdoms. Taiwan looked at the message with a deep frown while thinking over what was written in them for a considerably long time. On the one hand, his war with the Northern Army had reached a stalemate of sorts, and neither side was giving ground. On the other hand, it was getting more and more expensive to fight the Starks, and the supply gold from the mines was getting so low they might as well be considered non-existent. But to have peace with the Starks? Now. He highly doubted Rob Stark would stop at this point. Wolves did not stop fighting until they were satisfied, losing, or dead. Tywin knew the Northern Army was neither of those things right now. If he agreed first, it would be considered a sign of weakness by the North, and many would wish to drive forward to crush him. On the other hand, if Tywin went first, it would show he was willing to have peace, and if House Stark or the houses following him refused, the small folk would turn against them. Maybe even his own bannermen or the houses who followed the young wolf into battle in the first place. Already House Fry had pulled their support after what happened with the wolf breaking his promised marriage to one of Walder Frey's daughters. Holster Tully was getting sicker each day and would soon pass from this world. Meaning Riverrun was going to see a transition from father to son on who would be liege lord of the lands. As a result, Tywin knew his side could press the advantage, but this letter from the king had made him hesitant. Not to mention Jamie's continued health and life was something the old lion could not risk with an advancement. Even if he had some of his commanders like the mountain do most of the fighting on their end, how Stark might see it as a reason to make Jamie pay for such a move. It was a risk knowing either decision possessed good and bad points, which Tywin didn't like regardless of his choices. He had a week to sit on the issue. A week to plan. A week to figure out how to get what he wanted out of this and leaving his enemies dead on the ground. King's Landing Red Keep King's Office. You sent for me your grace, asked Sansa while being escorted into the room by one of the Kingsguard that she knew wasn't one of the abusers who once served Joffrey. Yes Lady Sansa. Have a seat. I thought we could talk. Face to face and without the usual gossipers from court who spread rumors just for the sake of spreading them, said Naruto with Sansa smiling before she sat down in the chair offered. Thank you, your grace. I never did get to express my appreciation for your assistance in protecting me from your brother Joffrey when he sat on the Iron Throne, replied Sansa while Naruto smirked. Just call me Naruto when we are here talking like this. Such high-level formalities are for court, important meetings, and parties. Since we are at neither of these three things, you can relax. As for your appreciation, you don't need to express it. Your face lighting up said it all. Also, a good deal of credit should go to my uncle Tyrion. 
He stepped up originally and I just came along to give his authority an extra push, said Naruto while Sansa nodded and frowned at the mention of Tyrion. Not to question you Naruto, but, is it truly wise to have a Lannister of people as your hand? Tywin Lannister was one and he betrayed his king when the moment suited him, questioned Sansa since she knew the story behind Tywin betraying the Mad King, the sacking of the city, and using it to prove his loyalty to Robert when the man took the throne. Quite true. Tywin Lannister did betray the Mad King because he saw where the winds of victory were blowing once Prince Rhaegar died at the hands of Robert at the Trident. But Tyrion is not a betrayer. Yes, he is a Lannister. Yes, he is Hand of the King just like his father was all those years ago. Will Tyrion betray me? No. Why? Because he loses so much more through betraying me. I take it you noticed one of your handmaidens is not from Westeros, correct, said Naruto with Sansa nodding. Shay. She's from somewhere in Essos I believe, answered Sansa with Naruto smirking at her. In truth, she is more than just a handmaiden. Shay is Tyrion's lover. But to ensure no one, namely my mother or Joffrey, would use her to target either of them, Tyrion used his position as temporary hand of the king before my arrival to make her your personal handmaiden. That way, she could be here in the Red Keep and walk around without anyone raising suspicion to her being here, said Naruto while Sansa was shocked to hear this. Why are you telling me this Naruto? Isn't a secret like this one being revealed a betrayal of Tyrion's trust in you, asked Sansa while Naruto leaned back in his chair. Not really. If you must know, I knew of their relationship from the start of being a king thanks to Varys. The spider knew before anyone else did of their relationship thanks to his little birds and made sure Tyrion knew that he knew. I was told because Varys didn't want me to become suspicious of Shay being a spy of some kind, sent by my enemies to learn about my actions while I ruled. As to why I'm telling you this, it is because I feel you should know the truth, and to not worry about trusting Shay in return. Tyrion fears his father will find a way to kill her if he learns of their relationship since she is a foreign woman with no real status and his standards are practically impossible to meet. Plus, his own opinion of his son is extremely low despite Tyrion being quite good in his position as Hand of the King. Of course, as King of the Seven Kingdoms, I can easily give my blessing on them being together, which I have, if only in secret. I would make it truly an official blessing, but we both know Tywin's reputation for getting what he wants one way or another, and he will do something to destroy their happiness. The same with Cersei and Joffrey if they learn the truth. Which is why so few people know about Tyrion and Shay being in a relationship to begin with. You are being told because it makes things a lot easier on them and their own fears of being discovered together by possible Lannister spies. You aren't one and I doubt you want to become one of them anytime soon, said Naruto with Sansa nodding, as she had seen the two look at each other at times, and it made things awkward for them. I won't tell anyone. I promise, said Sansa with Naruto smiling further. Good to hear. You will of course have to tell Shay that you know about her and Tyrion being a secret couple. Just make sure that you reveal that I told you when she no doubt asks how you know and tell her not to worry. I will of course tell Tyrion that I told you, but he will understand for the most part on why I did it, said Naruto with Sansa nodding, but it was clear she didn't fully understand. But why are you doing it? I still don't understand why I was chosen to know the secret when there must be others just as qualified to know and could keep it a secret all the same if required, said Sansa with Naruto smiling. The people who know, but won't tell those who shouldn't know is the best way to keep a secret relationship a secret. I believe keeping secrets can be poisonous in the long run if not handled properly. Whether we keep these secrets bottled up or share them with the wrong person tends to make a beautiful relationship die a slow and painful death said Naruto with Sansa nodding since she thought the same way. Which is why she didn't have the means to lie to anyone. Keeping secrets was one thing, but lying was another. Her mother always told her a woman of her standing must never lie to others. Especially her future husband when she finally married and wished for a long-lasting marriage filled with love along with a few children made from that love. Anything else Naruto? asked Sansa with Naruto nodding. Just one more thing Sansa. Given your stay here in King's Landing has considerably been better recently since I have become king, I wanted to know if you wanted to leave the city for Winterfell? To be properly escorted back to the north once safe passage is guaranteed, asked Naruto curiously while Sansa was a bit surprised, he was offering. You wish me to return home Naruto? questioned Sansa curiously. Well, no not really. But I know you must be missing your family a great deal. 
I have been unable to locate your sister Arya here in the city. So chances are, she isn't here in King's Landing and has made her way north without telling anyone. Your big brother Rob is fighting the Lannisters, and your younger brother Bran is running Winterfell with the aid of your maester to guide him and his actions, said Naruto while Sansa looked worried when he mentioned Arya and the war Rob was waging against the Lannisters. I would like to return home one day, but only after peace has been achieved, answered Sansa while Naruto smiling and nodding in understanding. He just hoped peace would happen and soon. The veil at the moment. Lisa Aaron was not happy. She was irate. Angry. Filled with rage to the point of nearly going mad. Her beloved Peter Baelish had not only been imprisoned, she had just learned of him being killed by the new king of Westeros. And for what? Conspiring to kill her old late husband, John Aaron? The man who spent more time fixing the late King Robert's messes instead of attending to her needs? Bah! Her husband was useless in being there for her. Peter had been there for her. In more ways than one. She had even given him a child, which Lisa made everyone believe was John's. Of course, she knew if the truth were ever revealed, it would not only destroy her, but Peter and her beloved Robin currently sucking on her breast at this very moment. How dare this king kill my Peter? How dare he kill my secret love? And for what? For the murder of my husband? Bankrupting the realm? My husband was old. The crown would have recovered once Peter manipulated events to fix it once becoming king of the Seven Kingdoms. I would have been his queen. Robin would have been a prince. I will not stand for this, thought Lisa while she summoned the Lords of the Vale to the main chamber. Lady Lisa, are you sure? asked Lord Royce of the Vale with Lisa glaring at him from her seat with Robin on her lap. Of course, I am. Call the banners. Every able body willing to fight for me. We are going to march on King's Landing and avenge Lord Baelish, commanded Lisa while she saw the Lords of the Vale seem uncertain. One of the charges against Lord Baelish before his execution was conspiring to murder the hand of the King John Aaron. Your husband. Not to mention he betrayed Ned Stark, who is your sister's late husband, said Lord Royce while Lisa's glare only intensified. Lies. All of it. Every charge. Every accusation. This king was jealous of Lord Baelish and his greatness. There can be only one response to this. War. I will have it Lord Royce or I will find someone who will, exclaimed Lisa angrily. You are asking the Vale to go to war against the new king of Westeros for dishonorable reasons, Lady Lisa. According to the message, Peter Baelish has openly confessed to his crimes against the crown, your husband, and your sister's husband. To march against the king now would be seen in his treason by all the other houses and kingdoms, protested one Lady Wainwood while Lisa's glare increased even further. Are you defying me Lady Wainwood? The ruler of the Vale until young Robin comes of age, asked Lisa while Lady Wainwood remained firm and unflinching from the hate-filled glare being sent toward her. I will not challenge you Lady Lisa, but no one here will obey the command to march against the king when the king has done nothing to deserve it, said Lady Wainwood firmly, as she saw Lisa Aaron become outraged by her decision and the decision of the other lords of the Vale being in full agreement. Fine. Let them have their way for now. When Robin comes of age, I will convince him to call for the banners of all the Vale knights to fight against the king. Robin listens to me and me alone. I will continue to rule through him and in the name of Lord Baelish, thought Lisa while glaring at the lords and ladies of the Vale she deemed traitors to her wishes and commands. She would deal with them soon enough. Northern encampment at the moment. A ceasefire? Absurd. Clearly this king has decided to support the Lannisters. Though given how Tyrion Lannister is his uncle and hand of the king, it was inevitable, said Roose Bolton while some lords around him nodding in agreement. No. I don't think that is the case, Lord Bolton. If this King Naruto did side with House Lannister, he would have supported Tywin Lannister before dealing with Stannis. This call for a ceasefire on both sides is to prevent the war from escalating further and causing additional problems for the small folk who suffer for our actions. Winter is coming with another short season of fall now that summer has officially ended. The more we drag this out, the less chance of fewer people surviving it. Remember, depending on how long the summer gets, the winter lasts twice as long. 
Do we really wish to continue a war and drain our supplies needed for that long cold winter that everyone here knows is coming, said Rob while looking at the lords of the north grimacing since their war with House Lannister did cause the overall level of food in the north and even further south to their current location to dwindle drastically. No, your grace. But the king's suggestion of handing over Jaime Lannister to his care is not something we should comply with. He is our most valuable hostage and the only one keeping Tywin Lannister from going on the offensive, said Roose Bolton while Rob let out a noise. I agree with Bolton. Giving up Jaime Lannister is like bending over, dropping your britches, and saying come here and fuck me up the ass Tywin Lannister right before you take it there. Even if this king wishes it, I don't like the idea at all. Plus, what is to stop this King Naruto from taking Jaime Lannister to Tywin shortly after we hand him over? Remember, this man is a Lannister on his mother's side of the family. He is Tywin Lannister's grandson through the brother fucking whore of a mother Cersei after all. A child from that bloodline is not to be trusted, said Ricard Karstark with disdain for all things Lannister. His son had been guarding Jaime when the messenger and him were plotting their escape that night. Had they tried something, Ricard had no doubt his son would have been caught in their trap and possibly killed in the process. It was only thanks to the sudden intervention by the Tarth woman, who was Lady Stark's now appointed bodyguard that such an event didn't happen and his son was safe. No doubt he is half Lannister through the Queen Regent. There is no question there Lord Karstark. But if he were a true Lannister supporter, why did Cersei flee Lannister King's Landing with just Joffrey? Why did he not support Tywin Lannister after ascending the Iron Throne? Why arrest Peter Baelish and Grand Maester Pycelle? Why order the death or the wall for the men from the city watch who betrayed my father and bannermen? Why make arrangements to return my father to the north and give ice to me to wield against the Lannister forces? Why did he have the spider warn me about the possible threat of the Greyjoys flanking us and the risk to an exposed north? No. The king sitting on the Iron Throne is not a Lannister supporter. I would wager a chest filled to the brim with gold that Tywin Lannister got a similar message of a ceasefire between us. As things are going, we should at least consider the idea of peace and hear what is being offered in return for it," said Rob while more of the northern lords nodded since they had heard about the king's actions since he took the Iron Throne from Joffrey. And if the terms made by the king are considered unfair or unreasonable, asked Roose Bolton with a clear dislike for this type of path Rob Stark wished to take now. All of us wanted our own kingdom away from the others, correct? If the king ruling in the south will not give reasonable terms for peace, we will have our own kingdom in the north, and we will rule over what is ours, said Rob while seeing the northern lords in the tent nodding in full agreement. The men of the north would have what was theirs. One way or another. King's Landing Red Keep Small Council Chambers. First, before we start any new business for the day, I would like to welcome Lord Tyrell to the small council as the master of law, said Naruto while Varys and Tyrion clapped for the man, who bowed graciously. Thank you for this position your grace. I will perform my duty with pride and honor this position deserves, said Mace while being a bit of a suck up, but not enough for Naruto to take offense since it was only natural for it to happen. Being on the small council was a high position after all. That's good to hear Lord Tyrell. All I ask of you while in this position as master of law or on this small council is to be honest with me about whatever news you bring to the small council chambers when we have meetings. I do not care if it's good or bad news. What I do care about is honesty and truth, as they are crucial to making strong and wise decisions not only for the good of all seven kingdoms, but for the realm of men, said Naruto with Lord Tyrell nodding and was a bit pleased he wouldn't have to be a yes man when dealing with the king. I will be honest in all matters your grace, said Lord Tyrell while Naruto nodded. Good man. Now, onto the first piece of kingly business of the day, which surrounds these seven damned wars between the wolf and the lion. Where do both houses currently stand on my proposal for a ceasefire and potential peace between them?" asked Naruto while looking at Varys for answers. They are still undecided your grace. My birds tell me while both sides are interested in your offer, they are hesitant to make the first move. No doubt they are afraid it will be considered a moment of weakness on their part by the opposite side. However, it should be noted the northern army led by Robb Stark appears more open to the idea to meeting and agreeing for peace. So long as the terms are considered just and fair in terms what they believe are reparations for the losses suffered against House Lannister. 
If not, they will seek to continue their rumored plan to break off from the Seven Kingdoms to be their own independent kingdom, answered Varus while Naruto grumbled something about stubborn stupid houses and their lords being the most stubborn of them all. We'll give both sides until the end of the week for them to give us an official answer to meeting for a ceasefire before we do anything else about them right now. What news of Storm's End? asked Naruto knowing his family's side of things suffered because of his uncle and himself. All the remaining bannermen of House Baratheon have returned home your grace. As you are now the only legitimate Baratheon left, they all humbly beg your forgiveness and your mercy for raising arms against you, said Varys with Naruto frowning slightly. Not like I have much choice since they are needed to protect it. Not to mention it needs a Baratheon there just as the North needs a Stark. Speaking of Baratheon blood, any word on my half-brother Gendry Waters, asked Naruto while Mace Tyrell looked confused. Not to speak out of turn here your grace, but why would you be interested in a bastard, asked Mace curiously. Why? Because he's my half-brother. He's one of my father's bastards. Possibly the only one left after Joffrey ordered the others be killed, said Naruto with his eyes narrowing at the memory of how the late Lord Commander of the City Watch had practically bragged about his accomplishment in killing all of them, including the babies, and doing the deed in front of the mothers of said babies no less. And as such, if he were legitimized, it would allow him to become a lord ruling over the Stormlands in the king's name, added Varys with Naruto nodding. Surely you don't wish to legitimize him your grace? He most likely has no education. No proper upbringing. No real understanding on how to run a house as noble as yours, protested Mace since he knew as well as everyone else here in the Seven Kingdoms that bastards were rarely allowed to live with their father if they were highborn, much less be legitimized by them. Gendry can learn Lord Tyrell. From what I understand, my half-brother is not an idiot despite his lack of education and is also a skilled blacksmith. If he can make weapons from just about any kind and other items out of metal, Gendry can learn how to rule over the Stormlands. I want him found Varus. Alive. Have some of your little birds go looking for him outside of the city. Chances are, Gendry got out of King's Landing before Joffrey did his little bastard purging. I assume you know what he looks like, said Naruto with Varus simply nodding. Of course, your grace. I saw him on many occasions during my walks through the city and when John Aaron along with Ned Stark first met the boy during their investigations on the issue surrounding Robert's bloodline, replied Varys while also seeing another reason behind Naruto's decision. With Gendry legitimized, upon Naruto's death, should the man have no children, the half-brother of the king would become king before Joffrey, the boy's questionable parentage notwithstanding. It would no doubt upset Cersei Lannister a great deal knowing the last surviving bastard Robert Syard was legitimized but became the next king before Joffrey. A good tactic to be sure, at least until Cersei found a way to have Gendry assassinated without it being traced back to her, and putting Joffrey back on the Iron Throne. Varys knew such an event would happen if Naruto were to die without an heir of his own, but he also knew that should it happen, Daenerys Targaryen would, hopefully, return to the Seven Kingdoms and smite her enemies. Lannisters included. If Naruto was still king by that point, Varys hoped to arrange for the two houses to mend things peacefully through marriage, and once more provide stability to the realm. Provided Naruto didn't marry Lady Marjorie prior to when Daenerys Targaryen finally came for what she wanted. Make sure your little birds know it too. I want Gendry brought back here alive. I need his help to save my house from near annihilation and to run things in the Stormlands while I am here in King's Landing as king, said Naruto firmly. With all due respect your grace, you already have a two brothers and a sister from your mother's side of the family, offered Mace Tyrell cautiously since he didn't want to make the king angry. Correct. I do. But they are also my half-siblings Lord Tyrell. We have the same mother, but different father, said Naruto before explaining to the man what he uncovered and the proof behind it which led to John Aaron and Ned Stark being killed for learning about it. I had no idea. I thought the raven sent to the reach by Stannis was his way of trying to acquire the Iron Throne through the right of succession in the event King Robert had no male heirs. But given Ned Stark also knew in John Aaron as well, those men were never the dishonorable kind to lie about such things, said Mace Tyrell while knowing he had to inform Elena of this immediately after the small council meeting, which is why I made Ned Stark's so-called confession before his death officially null and void. The man served my father faithfully during the rebellions and his hand of the king when called upon without question. He deserved better. Speaking of things related to my father and the rebellion that made him king, where is Daenerys Targaryen right now, 
replied Naruto while focusing on the issue his father had been obsessed with right before his death. Still an Esso's your grace. Only now, instead of a small Kalasar and three dragons, she has them, plus an army of 8,000 unsullied under her direct command. She apparently bought them using her strongest dragon, but the creature was unruly and burned its new owner alive before returning to her. After Lady Targaryen took full command of all the Unsullied, she ordered them to kill the masters there, and walked out of Astapor with all of them marching behind the woman. She offered them a choice of leaving Astapor free of their duties as Unsullied or free men willing to fight to free others while they served in her army. They chose the latter and marched out of Astapor carrying her banner proudly as free men, said Varys while Naruto surprised most of them by smirking at this news. Well at least someone cares about those men. Whoever thought up the way on how to train and make Unsullied should have had their cock cut off to know how it feels, said Naruto while wondering if any of the masters understood the evil they did in making those slaves into an army of obedient warriors. Probably not. Your grace, while I have no love for how the Unsullied are said to be trained in Essos, to wish that upon their makers seems a bit harsh, said Mace, as he had never seen one of the Unsullied in battle, or how they were trained so the idea of wishing such things on another was unsettling to him. My mother tried to have me become one of the Unsullied when I was just a child Lord Tyrell. She commanded my handmaiden, who would become my surrogate mother, to take me to Astapor after I was secretly sent away at the age of four. I don't know if you ever heard the stories about the Unsullied Lord Tyrell. But I assure you, most if not all of the stories of how the Unsullied become Unsullied are indeed true. As to the issue of Daenerys Targaryen, keep an eye on the woman and her progress Varys. I don't want to make her my enemy and I do not wish to provoke Lady Targaryen into becoming one like my father no doubt did when he gave the order to have assassins try and kill her, said Naruto while Varys nodded. Yes, your grace. But I highly doubt an assassin will ever get that close again given how Yora Mormont and now Ser Barris Tanselmi are now watching over her. Two seasoned advisors, who know much of the ways of Essos, and now Westeros will make Daenerys a ruler in a short amount of time as her position grows stronger, said Varys with Naruto nodding while cursing Joffrey for removing Ser Barristan from his service as the Lord Commander of the Kingsguard. Joffrey was an idiot to remove Ser Barristan from the Kingsguard. A man with his skill and honor inspires others to serve and bolster the ranks needed to defend the crown. Not only could Ser Barristan been helpful with the defense of the city during the Battle of Blackwater Bay, but I would have loved to have had a spar with him to test my own skills with a sword, remarked Naruto while seeing Varys and Tyrion nodding. Could we somehow send a message to Ser Barristan? Convince him to come back to the city and leave the Targaryen woman, offered Mace since he knew Ser Barristan was a reasonable and honorable man. I'm afraid not Lord Tyrell. Ser Barristan no doubt feels siding with Daenerys is the only way to make up for his own perceived failure to properly defend her brother Rhaegar just before Robert had successfully killed him at the Trident. No doubt things would have been different had Ser Barristan not been injured prior to that event and was by Rhaegar's side when the fighting between the two men at the Trident started, said Varys while Naruto grimaced. We will hold off on doing anything regarding Daenerys Targaryen, her growing army, or her dragons for the moment. We will keep an eye on her though and find out just what type of ruler she is when sitting in the seat of power over in Essos. If we need to send a message to her, your little birds can do it through Ser Barristan, and he can give any form of communication we send to Daenerys, ordered Naruto with everyone nodding. There is an issue regarding the late Lord Baelish's ledgers. I have been reviewing what I could in my spare time, but there is a lot to go through. From what I have already seen in those ledgers, it is quite a complex mess, said Tyrion knowing that was going to be an issue that would not go away for a while. I assure you your grace that House Tyrell would be willing to loan some form of money to aid the crown in combating this debt, offered Mace with Naruto shaking his head. The crown is already in debt to two different places Lord Tyrell. First, Tywin Lannister for roughly three million, and the other three million goes to the Iron Bank of Bravos. I will not borrow or take out a loan from a third source to pay off one of the other two. The best way to pay off the debt is to bring money into the crown. Not by borrowing it. Not by taking out a large loan. We need to boost trade, increase commerce, and seek a means of drawing traders from all over the seven kingdoms here to King's Landing to do good honest business. What we need to do is bring about a powerful economic boom to make the crown's coffers explode with gold so the debt is paid faster said Naruto knowing the more money flowed into King's Landing now, the sooner the debt was fully paid, and the incredibly large debt could be fully paid. Fortunately, all the brothels once owned by Littlefinger in the city are doing that quite nicely your grace. 
After things started to calm down from our victory over your uncle Stannis, there had been an increase in customers. Whatever gold I don't really need to maintain each establishment or the girls has been sent to the crown to lower the debt. While we still have a way to go, I feel a large dent has already been or soon will be made as a result, said Tyrion while Naruto nodded. Good. But that won't be enough. We need more income to destroy this monstrous debt Littlefinger made. Send a message to Prince Doran in Dorne and ask him if he would be interested in expanding trade with the crown. All the previous deals made all benefited Littlefinger or House Lannister with each getting the vast majority of the profits with the crown getting little to nothing. Also, ask for an update on Marcella and how she likes it in Dorne with the prince's son, said Naruto while Tyrion nodded. Speaking of your siblings, young Tommen is curious about why Joffrey, his mother, and most recently his sister are no longer in King's Landing? I tried to explain it to him, but it gets harder each time to tell the boy the truth, said Tyrion since he had been named de facto guardian over Marcella and Tommen since Naruto took the Iron Throne following Cersei fleeing with Joffrey for the Western Lands. I don't want to shelter him, but I also don't want to take away a piece of his innocence by telling Tom and his mother is a mean cunt. Not to mention all the other dark secrets she kept from just about everyone over the years. Just inform Tom and it's because of the war and that for the moment, it was done to keep him, Marcella, and even Joffrey safe from the enemies of our house, said Naruto while he felt keeping the true parentage of all three of his half-siblings a secret was best for Tom and. When the boy was older, Naruto knew his half-brother would understand. The same with Marcella. Joffrey? Not so much. But the latter of the three was an asshole so Naruto did not care if the little shit died anytime soon. There is also a matter of the red woman your grace. My little birds have told me she is currently taken up residence in Dragonstone and using her influence there to convert more followers to her religion. Though from what I understand, the faith behind this Lord of Light religion was weakened there due to Stannis's defeat and of course, his execution by your hands. But still, the Red Woman is quite persistent and has regained much of her old followers along with you, said Varys, as he saw Naruto grimace, and drumming his right hand on the table while in deep thought, no doubt using Stannis's wife and daughter as a means to stay as an honored guest of Dragonstone. We need to get them out of there. At the very least, we must to get my poor cousin Shireen away from the Red Woman before the damn priestess decides to burn her in a sacrifice to that damn Lord of Light, said Naruto with the men in the room going pale at the mere thought of an innocent child being burned alive. It would be reminiscent of the Mad King all over again. We would need an ally of sorts. Someone who is not swayed by this Red Woman and who knows Dragonstone well enough to get Lady Shireen out of the castle to safety here in King's Landing, said Mace while Naruto sighed and gave a nod knowing it was true. Unfortunately, we don't know anyone of such caliber Lord Tyrell. If we did, I would employ them immediately, said Naruto while rubbing his face and looking concerned for his cousin. Elsewhere at the moment, a lone figure on some rocks was stirred awake. The water from the sea around him was very good at waking him up after what felt like forever. Looking around, the man found himself struggling to stand, his body in pain, and it hurt to move much less breathe. As he stood, the memory of the Battle of Blackwater Bay filled his mind, and the green fire that nearly killed him. The same green fire that killed his son. I'm alive? I should be dead. How am I still living, thought Ser Davos while wondering what happened to Stannis and the battle itself. Did Stannis win? Was he the new king of Westeros? Was the Red Woman sacrificing people in the name of her god with Stannis's approval? His question ceased when a ship was sailing by and saw his chance to get off his small rocky island. Using his shirt as a flag, Ser Davos waved it over his head, shouting for the ship to stop and turn around to get him to dry land. Fortunately, the ship's crew were able to hear him and were sailing a smaller boat over to his position. Who are you? asked one of the boatmen. Ser Davos Seaworth. I fought at the Battle of Blackwater Bay, said Ser Davos while the men looked at each other. Under which banner? asked the boatman. The banner of the one true king of Westeros. Stannis Baratheon, declared Ser Davos after a moment since his response would determine if these men would help him. Apparently, it was the correct response since they threw him a rope and allowed the man to get in their rowboat to the main one. Only to meet a familiar face he didn't think would be seen anytime soon. You are alive my friend. After what happened with the wildfire, I assumed you had been among the many men who perished that night. I mourn for the loss of you and your son when I thought you perished from this world, said Salador's son with a large smile on his face and hugged the former smuggler. 
Glad to know I was missed. Any news of my son? Did he survive the overall battle? The wildfire, asked Ser Davos, with Salator shaking his head. Alas, you are the only one I know who did. Whatever soldiers survived the wildfire were soon killed during the fighting on the beaches they landed on. The rest of the ships which did not land, aside from my own, took off when they saw another, much darker fire erupts on the shores where your King Stannis was fighting. Soon after, House Tyrell came along with their army, and sided with King Naruto to crush what little army Stannis had left with him on the shoreline. Your one true king was soon captured and later on, he was put to the sword for his actions against his own house and the crown, said Salador with Ser Davos looked shocked by this. She was wrong. The red woman was wrong about Stannis, remarked Ser Davos with Salador shook his head and laughed. You sound so surprised my friend. You shouldn't. The red woman is not of her right mind. Since the Battle of Blackwater Bay, the woman has been burning more than just statues of the Seven. She has been burning people Davos. Alive. Claiming them to be servants of the darkness, said Salador with Ser Davos looking horrified by this. What about Stannis's wife? His daughter Lady Shireen? She didn't burn them, right? Asked Ser Davos while Salador waved off his questions. No. Nothing like that. Not yet. But you shouldn't be thinking about them my friend. You should be considering what to do with your own life at this point. With Stannis now dead, your life is now without purpose. You should join me. Like the old days. I could use your old smuggling skills to get what I want from places that won't give me what I want, said Salador with Ser Davos shaking his head. No. I can't. Lady Shireen needs me. I need to get back to Dragonstone, said Ser Davos with Salador shaking his head. Have you not heard a word I have said Davos? The red woman is sacrificing people she believes are her enemies. Both of us are criminals. One for piracy and the other for smuggling. I am not about to be burned alive for you when caught near the shores of Dragonstone by her followers, said Salador while Ser Davos was pacing around the room. You don't need to come ashore. I'll go. But I need to get to Dragonstone. I can't let the damn woman corrupt or sacrifice Lady Shireen for her damn god. I don't need you to come with me. I just need a damn ship. I don't care if it's small. I just need one to get into Dragonstone and get Lady Shireen out of there, pleaded Ser Davos while Salador just sighed. And say you do. Where will you go? You think the girl's mother is going to just stand by and let you take her only child from the only place she knows? You will be a wanted man. Hunted from one end of the Seven Kingdoms to the next, said Salador with Ser Davos nodding grimly since taking a member of House Baratheon away from her mother was basically signing his death warrant. I can't take her to Essos. Or to Bravos. Such an innocent girl would sadly draw far too much attention with her condition. We would stand out easily enough to be found out by those hunting us by the end of the day of our arrival. I dare not take her to Dorne. Even if they offered her their protection, I fear for her innocence in both her body and mind with some of the things they practice there. And if House Tyrells have truly sided with King Naruto, I don't set foot in the reach with Stannis's only child. I might try the North, but with the war surrounding the Lannisters makes that route very dangerous. Not to mention even the idea of taking Lady Shireen to the western lands toward the Lion's Den that is the domain of House Lannister themselves would be a disaster, said Ser Davos listing off his options. Or lack of options in this case. I would also advise you stay away from the Vale my friend. Word has it Lisa Aaron is not of sound mind herself. The death of the former master of coin Peter Littlefinger Baelish has apparently destroyed her already fragile mentality and wants a war with the king to avenge him. But the lords of the Vale won't commit to such a thing given the crimes Baelish was found guilty of and killed over. Given how the king is a Baratheon, Lisa Aaron will see the girl dying by her command if you enter the Vale with her as a justifiable act for the unjust execution of Lord Baelish. From what rumors I have heard from some of the other sailors I have met with who traveled to the Vale recently, the very much crazed woman is itching for a fight with the king and is seeking any excuse to get one. We both know, if Lady Shireen is killed by this woman, the king will act, and Lisa Aaron will command the lords of the Vale to raise their bannermen to fight back in the defense of the Vale. Regardless if it is her fault or not, said Salador with Ser Davos groaning.
Damn, exclaimed Ser Davos while slamming his fist hard into the table that was in the room. Of course, you could smuggle the girl out of Dragonstone before taking her to the one place you didn't think of going, offered Salador with a smile. Where? There is no place for me to take Lady Shireen where she can be safe from the Red Woman or the enemies of House Baratheon, protested Ser Davos angrily. Except to King's Landing. Her cousin is the king after all, suggested Salador with Ser Davos looking at him like he had grown a second head on his shoulders. The very same king her father tried to fight and lost against. The same king who you just told me has executed her father for his crimes. I'm not about to trust Lady Shireen's life to the man who just killed Stannis, his own uncle, for treason, said Ser Davos with Salador giving him a I'm being serious here, look that brokered no other recourse. You have no other choice Davos. Besides, do you really believe this king to be so cruel to punish the girl for the crimes of her father? He already paid for them with his life. I do not see this man punishing her for Stannis's crimes. Kneel at his feet. Beg for mercy and for the girl's life to be spared. Suck his cock if you have to go so low. I don't care how you do it. But know this, if you go through with the plan to smuggle her out, it is going to be done without my help once you get off the boat, I give you the moment it touches the shores of Dragonstone, said Salador with Ser Davos closing his eyes and clenching his fists. Just get me to the shores of Dragonstone. I'll manage from there. The Red Woman won't know what I'm doing back there and even if she asks, I'll just tell her it's to protect Lady Shireen. I doubt the Red Woman will even know how I plan to go about protecting Lady Shireen, said Ser Davos with Salador nodding. Fine. Just don't get yourself killed Davos. I like you. You are a good smuggler and we have had many adventures together. I would hate to find out you were burned alive by this woman all to appease her god, said Salador with a smile on his face. I, you'll get no argument from me there, remarked Ser Davos with his friend now letting out a hearty laugh and the two shared a drink. Perhaps things were turning around after all. Chapter 6 The Red Wedding Part 1 Lord Holster Tully is dead, asked Naruto with Varys nodding grimly. Yes, your grace. Passed away in his sleep a few nights ago. Riverrun and the Realm of Men are a much darker place without him in it, said Varys since he knew Holster was a good liege lord and good to all the people who served under him. Damn. Just when both sides agreed to a temporary ceasefire, said Naruto knowing the death of Holster Tully might make Tywin Lannister bold enough to break the ceasefire both sides had agreed upon. The idea of peace talks at King's Landing between House Stark and House Lannister was still in the air at the time, but this now changed things. While Holster Tully's son would no doubt succeed his father as liege lord of Riverrun, Naruto was not confident the man would be as good as his father. Varys had expressed that concern too when stating the man could be a bit of an idiot at time and quite impulsive when wanting to prove himself. The funeral is scheduled soon your grace. The entire northern army has pulled back to honor Holster Tully while at the same time, my birds tell me Tywin Lannister has been remaining silent and has yet to make a move. Jamie's imprisonment no doubt being a key factor in that decision, said Varys with Naruto nodding. And I can't attend since it puts me at risk for anyone daring to kidnap the king during these unstable times. While I'm not worried about facing any kind of danger, I can't risk my presence causing an unneeded stir among those itching for a fight. Shit. Any word about Arya Stark? Or Gendry Waters, asked Naruto with Varys making a grimacing face. Unknown your grace. There are rumors of a girl resembling Arya Stark making it north near Winterfell with the men being sent to the Wall, but it is hard to say. As for Gendry, it would seem he was among the group heading for the Wall, but the Lannister men from a previous encounter spooked the boy into fleeing, and if what my birds have told me are true, ran into the Brotherhood without banners, said Varys while Naruto ran his hand through his scalp. Outlaws your grace. All of them. They should be hanged as criminals, remarked Mace while Naruto shook his head. We can't Lord Tyrell. They are a third party in this war. They take no sides in it, except for the side of the small folk. If we arrest them now, we lose face with the small folk, and even some of the highborn lords who rely on the small folk. From what Varys has told me of them in passing, the men were originally assembled by the late Ned Stark to bring justice down upon Gregor Clegane for his raiding on the Riverlands. Now they seem to have turned into this and have been attacking anyone who makes the small folk suffer. Regardless if they be House Clegane, House Lannister, or even House Stark since the Brotherhood without banners only cares about those who have no one to protect them. 
It is what makes them secretly loved by the people. If we go after them, we lose the support of the people and cause more problems in the city that we do not want, said Naruto with Varus nodding. So, this Gendry boy is with the Brotherhood now, asked Tyrion for clarification while Varus grimaced once more. He was with them Lord Hand. For a time. But they ran into someone we know and she took him with her to Dragonstone, said Varus while Naruto's hands became fists. The Red Woman. Melisandre, exclaimed Naruto angrily. The very same. No doubt she needs him for something surrounding her magic like she did with Stannis in order to kill Renly. No doubt something to remove you your grace, said Varys while many in the room were worried about why she needed Gendry. We need to get Gendry out of there and soon, remarked Naruto while hoping his half-brother wasn't sacrificed like so many others had been rumored to be at the hands of that damn woman. To take Dragonstone, you would need an army your grace. An army we do not have nor have time to conscript. I doubt many will willingly fight and fight for us to only save two people from the Red Woman's religious sacrifices, replied Varus with Naruto tapping his fingers against the table in thought. Right now, they needed a miracle. Something. Anything. Dragonstone at the moment. Ser Dabo Seaworth made his way on shore. He quickly waved away his old pirate buddy and proceeded to make his way up to the castle. If asked, Ser Davos knew he would have to tell the truth, if only to a point, to make his survival at the Battle of Blackwater Bay, and his return here all the more believable should the Red Woman ever demand to know his whereabouts. He knew all the key smuggling points surrounding Dragonstone, as it was something Stannis wished to know should it be invaded during his time ruling there, and attacked by a rival house in a time of war. Also Stannis could get his family to safety no matter the outcome of such an event. If there are any gods, whether one or more above, I thank them for this good fortunate of getting in here unnoticed, thought Ser Davos while he made his way to Lady Shireen's room and gave the door a quick knock. Ser Davos, exclaimed Shireen Baratheon happily at seeing the old man. Not so loud Lady Shireen. I'm here on secret business, whispered Ser Davos while he motioned the girl to keep her voice down. Sorry. I didn't mean it. I heard you died at the Battle of Blackwater Bay. Did you really survive wildfire? asked Shireen in a whispery voice. Yes, I did. Though it was sheer luck my lady. I fell unconscious and the water launched me onto some rocks. I was fortunate not to drown, answered Ser Davos while keeping out the fact his son had perished during the battle. And my father? Mother won't tell me anything. I heard her screaming and crying out in sorrow. Did he, did he die? asked Shireen with a bit more seriousness and worry in her tone. Yes, my lady. From what I heard, your cousin and King Naruto Baratheon carried out the act himself in the throne room of the Red Keep. He told the court about your father's crimes before taking his head off. But that's not why I am here, said Ser Davos while he saw Shireen become sad over the loss of her father. Why are you here? Without my father, you have no real purpose anymore, said Shireen with Ser Davos smiling slightly. Not exactly my lady. While Stannis is dead, my duty to him and your house did not die. I still have a duty to you. To protect you, said Ser Davos with Shireen smiling at him, but was still confused. Protect me? From what? Who? Do you mean my cousin? asked Shireen while hoping her cousin and the king wasn't going to demand her head for what happened with her father. No, my lady. From the red woman, said Ser Davos while Shireen frowned. I don't like her. When she stares at me, it feels like something else is watching through her eyes. Something scary, remarked Shireen with Ser Davos frowning since he had an idea of what that something really was and wanted to do to the girl. Not while he still drew breath. He may be a lowly knight, but Ser Davos was still a knight loyal to House Baratheon Dammit. And Ser Davos was going to do his duty in protecting Stannis's only living child from harm. Which is why I don't want you staying here at Dragonstone anymore. Not while she is here, said Ser Davos firmly, but where will I go? Can mother come too? asked Shireen worriedly. Your mother can't come with us my lady. She is too loyal to the Red Woman and not of her right mind. If she caught us leaving, we would be punished. Most likely you watching me getting sacrificed by fire for the Lord of Light. As to where we are going, call me a tad crazy, but I think you would be safe with your cousin, the king, in King's Landing, said Ser Davos with Shireen looking at him in surprise. But he killed my father. Won't he kill me? asked Shireen with a hint of worry in her tone. I don't believe he will do that my lady. 
From what I have heard, your cousin is a good king, and only did his duty as king to punish your father for his crimes. I also know that if you stay here, it could mean the death of you in the future, and I can't risk it. My duty as a loyal knight of the realm demands I act in your best interest and right now your best interest is getting far away from the red woman, replied Ser Davos with Shireen not liking the idea of leaving Dragonstone or her mother. Still, it had to be done. I guess we have no choice but to leave. Lady Melisandre is going to sacrifice me, isn't she? He asked Shireen with sadness in her eyes and tone of voice. I wouldn't put it past her. We need to pack up your things and carefully get you out of Dragonstone. I can get us a large enough boat for the two of us and get us on a course for King's Landing, said Ser Davos with Shireen nodding, but frowned. But what about Gendry? asked Shireen with Ser Davos now frowning, but in confusion at the mention of the name. Who is Gendry? asked Ser Davos curiously. I met him when I snuck into the dungeons to see who Melisandre brought down there and talked to him. He was brought to Dragonstone just a few days ago. She seemed very interested in him for some reason. Something about his blood being descended from that of a king related to my father, said Shireen with Ser Davos thinking over what the girl just told him before it clicked. King's blood? Connected to her father? Could it be one of Robert Baratheon's bastards? But I thought they were all killed. One must have survived Joffrey's butchery and is now here in Dragonstone. But why does the Red Woman need him for his blood, thought Ser Davos while he had an idea it was magic-related and would only bring about pain for the boy if left here. Ser Davos asked Shireen while seeing him thinking. We'll take him too. Whatever the Red Woman has planned for this Gendry boy, I can guarantee you it won't be anything pleasant. Besides, I think your cousin and King will be interested in meeting him too, said Ser Davos with Shireen now showing a smile that lit up the room in his opinion. I'll go get ready. You sneak down to the dungeons and free Gendry, said Shireen while Ser Davos nodded. As my lady commands, replied Ser Davos while hurrying to the dungeons to free the boy who was clearly more valuable than he was sure even Melisandre knew. And on a personal note, Ser Davos was looking forward to thwarting the woman's plans for these two. It was his revenge for her deceiving Stannis into fighting his own nephew over joining him. Back in King's Landing the Red Keep small council chambers. Anything else to report for today? asked Naruto while keeping his anger in check over not finding Arya or Gendry. Something of interest on an unrelated topic your grace. My birds have learned of Roos of House Bolton and Walder of House Fry at the twins have been having been sending each other messages. Interesting enough, Walder Fry has successfully married off one of his larger daughters to the Lord of House Bolton with as much as silver to match the woman's weight as a dowry. There was also talk of some other plans surrounding another possible wedding and Rob Stark's name was mentioned. However, it was all quite vague from what I have gathered so far. My little birds need more time to gather information for me and they can only gather it so fast before informing me of it, said Varys with Naruto growling since he had heard of Walder Fry and his actions in delaying his army to aid Robert during the rebellion. The late Walder Fry. That was the nickname Holster Tully gave him for being late to aid Robert Baratheon until near the end of the battle at the Trident. It was only when Robert was going to be the clear victor did Walder Frey's army join with him in the end, said Tyrion since he had asked his father about that once, but it was his uncle Kevin who told him why the Lord of House Frey got his nickname. Yes. I heard that story too when I was in Essos. Prince Oberyn told it to me after our time in the fighting pits had ended. Walder Fry is what is called an opportunist. He is seeking to get the best deal for himself while fucking over anyone he sees standing in his way, said Naruto while having no love for House Fry as a whole. My father doesn't like him either. But just because he dislikes Lord Walder Fry doesn't mean Tywin Lannister won't do business with him if the opportunity presents itself, said Tyrion knowing his father was more of a ruthless strategist first, commander second, and opportunist a close third though sometimes one pulled ahead of the other when time called for one to surpass the two in front of it. True, but I doubt even Tywin Lannister would trust or do business with Walder Fry in this instance. With his son Jaime close by as a prisoner of the Stark camp, Tywin knows the risks awaiting him and how it would endanger his son. Who is to say Jaime Lannister would be trading one prison for the next? A much crueler prison deep within the twins and Walder Fry knowing time when Lannister is willing to pay an extremely heavy price for his son's freedom? The fact Roose Bolton and him are scheming together behind Rob Stark's back is most vexing, said Naruto in a calm yet cold demeanor. We could warn Rob Stark your grace? 
Surely one of the spider's little birds could send a message directly to him? Suggest Mace Tyrell with Naruto shaking his head, and say what Lord Tyrell? That Roose Bolton is marrying one of Walder Frey's fatter daughters with a chest of silver to match the weight? That the two mentioned a wedding, which for all we know could be the wedding Roose Bolton is having or did have to help celebrate his new bride joining his house? No. If we act now, at this point in time, we tip our hand, and in doing so we cause a shitload of problems that may or may not be real. Still, Roose Bolton has a dark reputation of his own not unlike House Fry, and the two houses getting together like this, something doesn't sit right. My instincts are saying that there is trouble here. Trouble for House Stark. We just can't identify it. Not fully. Varus. Have your little birds keep an eye on things between those two houses and inform me if any of the news they find is dark like I suspect. Also, see if any of these two houses try to make contact with anyone from House Lannister. Something tells me that one or both of them just might get in contact with Lord Tywin. Especially if it means making a profit off the lion's large mountain of gold in exchange for Jaime Lannister's release from his confinement, said Naruto with Varys nodding since he also suspected as much. If I were one of them, I know I would try to make the attempt, remarked Tyrion since he knew if things were the other way around, his own family would definitely try to get as much out of a hostage or prisoner as possible. On another note, send a raven to Rob Stark at Riverrun to express my condolences over the loss of Holster Tully. Just because I can't be there doesn't mean I can pay my respects in some manner where it is well deserved. I won't have the people of the Riverlands feel insulted that the king doesn't mourn the loss of their liege lord, said Naruto while he saw Varys nodded before dismissing the meeting. Your grace? May I come in, asked Marjorie Tyrell after knocking on the open door. Of course, Lady Marjorie. We just finished a meeting. What is on your mind, replied Naruto while the woman smiled at him. I was wondering if you mind walking with me through one of the gardens and talking. We are courting and you did say we should get to know one another, said Marjorie with Naruto smirking. That I did. A stroll through the gardens we shall go, said Naruto while offering the woman his hand, which she took, and the two started their long walk through the castle to one of the many gardens. How goes the small council meetings you have been attending, asked Marjorie while they walked. Given the state of the realm, they are all very important. At the moment, House Stark and House Lannister are currently having a barely stable ceasefire in effect. Holster Tully has recently died and I can't even attend the funeral of the most respected man in all of Riverrun. Some king I am. I could destroy any attacker or army sent my way, but due to the fragile state of the realm needing me here in King's Landing, I'm stuck here, said Naruto while Marjorie smiled since she knew his suffering in terms of being confined when going out into the world to do something noble called to her. We must go about our lives as our stations in life demand of us your grace. Whether we are a king of the seven kingdoms or the lady of High Garden from the Reach. While it would be proper etiquette for you to go to Riverrun and pay your respects, the realm is not stable or safe for you to travel right now. Imagine being ambushed by bandits or the Brotherhood without banners? Imagine one of them getting a lucky shot in with an arrow or sword or spear to your chest or head? Without an heir to one day take the Iron Throne, the right to rule would fall back to Prince Joffrey, replied Marjorie while leaving out the fact she knew Joffrey wasn't qualified to be king due to his true parentage. Her father had said as much when writing a message to Olena to ensure their family wasn't tainted by such a union. They may want a queen of their blood ruling over the Seven Kingdoms, but House Tyrell wasn't that desperate. Like Dorne, the Reach had a higher tolerance for the more sexual intimacies between people and even their own offspring produced by it. But they also drew the line at the whole marrying inbred bastards, who had said secret to prevent a major scandal type thing. Which is one of the reasons I can't afford to die anytime soon, remarked Naruto in a humorous tone and smile that made Marjorie laugh. Do you think both House Stark and House Lannister will agree to a long lasting peace? asked Marjorie curiously. I hope they do. As the Starks always say with the house motto, winter is coming. The more they fight, the shorter supply of food the people have to survive it. Soon, the longest summer on record will only be surpassed a winter that I suspect will be twice as long, if the stories on how the two seasons act are true, said Naruto with Marjorie grimacing. Sadly, they are true. A long summer means the winter is twice as long. It will not be easy to feed people during such cold and dark times ahead, said Marjorie with Naruto nodding, which is all the more reason to get this war to end. 
We need these men to stop fighting each other and start preparing for the winter that is to come, said Naruto simply. It may become more difficult, your grace. I heard a rumor that Walder Fry is unhappy with Rob Stark. A promised marriage was arranged between House Fry and House Stark, but latter broke it to marry a foreign woman he apparently fell in love with during the fighting. She is a healer from what I was told, said Marjorie, as her grandmother had kept tabs on the war like everyone else, and her agents were now second only to the spider at this point. And Walder is known for being a man who holds a grudge from what I have been told in passing, remarked Naruto with Marjorie nodding. His position with the twins will only grow stronger now that Holster Tully is dead. I am also told the late liege lord's son is a tad arrogant and does not have the same potential in ruling over the Riverlands, said Marjorie with Naruto grimacing making Walder Fry all the more dangerous. This is a chance for him to stop answering to a liege lord and possibly becoming one if he plays things out correctly in his favor, said Naruto with a hint of concern how this, added to what he knew of Walder Fry and the communication with House Bolton about some kind of wedding made him uneasy. Grandmother never liked Walder Fry. He has a small army of children waiting for him to die. Both bastards and legitimate children. And has had almost as many wives all of them young. Some younger than myself. Barely reaching adulthood when he claims them in his bed, replied Marjorie while she shivered in disgust. Now I have all the more reason to have Varys keep an eye on House Fry and on House Bolton, thought Naruto while he walked and talked with Marjorie about other things. As he first suspected when courting her, this beautiful woman from the Reach was indeed a smart one and didn't rely entirely on beauty to get what she wanted. Her grandmother had taught Marjorie well, seeing the potential for the woman to be something beyond that of a pretty face. She genuinely cared about people knowing they were the lifeblood of any region or kingdom and without their continued happiness there was no continued loyalty. It was quite refreshing for Naruto to be around a woman who actually knew what he was talking about when regarding important matters. She didn't just laugh and nod when he talked. She didn't shake her head and change the subject simply because it bored her. No. Marjorie was well-educated with a wit to match and wasn't some weak dainty woman who expected the man to do all the heavy lifting in the relationship. He could honestly say this relationship was moving forward at a good healthy pace. For Marjorie, she was actually feeling the same way about Naruto. Here was a man who despite having a pig for a father cared about what she thought and asked for her insight. He didn't tell Marjorie to hush. He didn't pretend to listen when she voiced her opinion. He valued it. He encouraged it. He didn't even try to silence her voice or try to change the subject like any other man in his position as king would. It was hard to imagine given how Naruto's parents were and how they treated him before getting shipped off to Essos. Dragon stoned the dungeons. The moment Ser Davos saw Gendry Waters, the former smuggler knew the boy was in fact a Baratheon. The very features of his father were showing as clear as day and just about anyone who had seen the late King Robert in his younger years knew Gendry had many of his father's various features. The boy had the hair, the eyes, and even the overall muscles Robert was known to have before letting himself go with the drinking, hunting, and whoring. Who are you? asked Gendry cautiously since his experience with the Brotherhood and the Red Woman had made him hesitant to trust anyone. I'm here to get you out, said Ser Davos while getting the keys and moving toward the boy's cell. Why? So, you can send me to that crazy woman in the red dress? asked Gendry with a hint of anger in his blue eyes. No. What I mean is, you are getting out of here, out of Dragonstone, and going to King's Landing. You, me, and Lady Shireen, replied Ser Davos with Gendry looking at him in confusion. Lady Shireen? The girl with the strange markings on her face, asked Gendry since he only met the girl once. Yes. Since you don't know much of the outside world, I'll tell you this only once. Do not insult Lady Shireen. Those strange markings on her face are from a disease most thought to be incurable. They are scars that will never heal and she will have them to the end of her days. If you badmouth her in any way, I do not care if you are the illegitimate son of a king or nephew of my late Lord Stannis, I'll kill you on the spot myself, said Ser Davos, as he had heard some men talk about the girl when they thought no one was looking and discreetly reported it to Stannis. Those men were never seen again in word soon spread on the why so no one dared speak ill of Stannis's only child. Fair enough. But why are you doing this? And why are you saying I'm the illegitimate son of a king and the nephew to your lord Stannis, asked Gendry while Ser Davos unlocked the cell and looked at him closely. No one has told you anything, asked Ser Davos with Gendry shaking his head. 
Only I have the blood of a king in me. But I'm a bastard. At least, that is what I was told my entire life. Bastards aren't exactly loved by everyone, replied Gendry with Ser Davos nodding. No one can dispute that. Sadly, you are a bastard, but a bastard of the late King Robert of House Baratheon. Your uncles were my late Lord Stannis and his brother the late Lord Renly. Currently your legitimate half-brother, the now King Naruto of House Baratheon, sits on the Iron Throne in King's Landing. I need to take you to him in the hopes he can protect you from the Red Woman. From what I have seen so far, any plans for you here are not going to be pleasant, said Ser Davos with Gendry nodding. She used leeches to drain my blood and threw them into the fire, calling out to her god to smite the new mad king she said was currently sitting on the Iron Throne. To avenge her god's champion and bring about a new age for the Lord of Light to shine down upon the heretics of Westeros, said Gendry while shuddering at what he felt when she did that to him. And what happened? asked Ser Davos while stopping them to check to see if the way was clear. The fire glowed brightly. At first, she was pleased by it. But then, then she frowned at what she was staring at in the flames. As if the answers she was seeking were not in there at all. Or she was told something, but not what was expected, said Gendry while Ser Davos was surprised to hear this. I guess the woman's powers aren't absolute after all with her Lord of Light, thought Ser Davos while motioning the younger man to follow. Am I really the son of a king? asked Gendry with Ser Davos nodding. I, you are one. I don't know what designs your half-brother may have for you once we get to King's Landing. But I know it's a far better fate over what the Red Woman plans for you. Trust me boy, I have seen my fair share of what she has done here. You don't want to be a part of it, said Ser Davos before they ran into Shireen's room and saw the girl was ready to depart. I took only what I can manage. I hope it's not too much, remarked Shireen while she was holding a sizable bag, which consisted of some clothing, books, and other items she felt might useful in her journey to King's Landing. Don't worry my lady. As a knight serving your house, it's my duty to do the heavy lifting. Now we need to hurry. The sooner we leave Dragonstone for King's Landing the better. Also, both of you must be very quiet. If we are caught, well, it's best not to think of it, said Ser Davos taking Shireen's luggage before the trio made their way to the boat where the Onion Knight had left it and they got in before silently making their escape for greener pastures. Or in this case, safer waters. River run some time later. The funeral of Holster Tully happened mostly without incident. The only minor setback was Edmir Tully, the son of Holster Tully, was unable to shoot the fire arrow at his late father's boat as it sailed down the river. It had been embarrassing to say the least and it ended with Holster's younger brother known as the Blackfish doing it properly after he gauged the wind blowing prior to his shot. Fortunately, the fire arrow hit its mark, and the boat was sent aflame before floating away down the river out of sight. Now the people attending the funeral had to deal with the aftermath of this moment and what it meant now that Holster Tully was no longer among the living. If I may, nephew, I have encountered a situation with one of my lieutenants at the stone mill which may have some bearing on, said Edmure, but was interrupted by his uncle. Why don't you shut up about the damn mill? And don't call him your nephew. This man is your king. At the very least, he is now the warden of the north and still outranks you in position, stated Blackfish angrily at Edmure. Rob knows I mean no disrespect uncle I, protested Edmure, but the glare silenced him. You're lucky I'm not your king or the liege lord of Riverrun. If I was, I wouldn't wave your blunders around like some damn victory flag, exclaimed Blackfish in anger. My so-called blunders sent Tywin's mad dog scurrying back to Casterly Rock with his tail between his legs just before the temporary ceasefire was made official. I think King Rob understands that we're not going to win this war if it still continues, if he is the only one winning any battles. There is plenty glory to go around, countered Edmure while Rob looked at him angry cold eyes. It's not about the glory. It's about justice. Justice for my father. Justice for House Stark. Justice for the North, exclaimed Rob while smashing his fist on the table. My apologizes, said Edmure while Rob tried to regain control of his temper. Your instructions prior to the ceasefire were to wait for him to come to you. That was the plan, said Rob while Edmure just blinked at him. I seized an opportunity. You would have done just as much in my place, said Edmure, but Rob wasn't convinced. What was the value of the stone mill, asked Rob. The mountain was garrisoned across the river from it, answered Edmure like it was the simplest thing in the world. Is he there now, asked Rob while tapping his fingers on the table. 
Of course not. We took the fight to him. He couldn't withstand us and he fled, answered Ednir confidently with pride in his voice. That is not what I wanted nor commanded. I want to draw the mountain deeper into the west, into our country, where we could easily surround him and his men before killing them all. Without the mountain or his men loyal to him, Tywin Lannister would lose yet another crucial piece on the board. The whole point of the plan was for him to chase us. Not the other way around. The mountain is a mad dog, who loves to fight so long as he is a losing, and does not have a single strategic thought in his head. I could have had his head on a pike right now. Instead, I have a stone mill and the ceasefire in effect prevents anything further for both sides, said Rob while Edmure looked down in shame while the blackfish let out a chuckle. We still took hostages. Willem Lannister and Martin Lannister offered Edmure while Rob didn't look pleased or impressed. Willem and Martin Lannister are 14 years old. Children, said Rob. Martin is 15 years old I believe, corrected Blackfish. We have had Jaime Lannister for some time now and Tywin Lannister has not once sent a messenger stating he wished to sue for peace. Do you really think he will sue for peace any faster because we have his father's brother's great-grandsons? Questioned Rob, as he saw Ed Muir again look down in shame. No, replied Ed Muir. How many men did you lose? Asked Rob knowing Ed Muir's blunder no doubt cost the North some good men. 208 men. But for every man we lost, the Lannisters lost, said Ed Muir, but Rob's fist hitting the table and making an actual dent shut him up. Those 208 men could have been alive right now. Instead, they are rotting in the ground and all over a damn stone mill, exclaimed Rob angrily since he valued his men and their lives. I'm sorry. I didn't know, said Ed Muir while Rob let out a heavy sigh. You would have known. Right here today at the gathering, if you had just been patient, said Rob knowing his army was slowly losing momentum. We seem to be running you on patience here, said Blackfish since he could see how short the temper Rob was showing right now wasn't a good thing. A problem we need to fix, remarked Rob knowing if he lost any more patience on his part was not a good thing. Unfortunately, such hope of this moment in his life would end would not happen. In fact, it wasn't over by a long shot, as a few days later, Walder Frey's envoys came, and they were clearly not happy with Rob. It showed on their faces and in the way they walked into the room to speak to him. Black and Lothar Fry were very straightforward in their demands of Rob, which consisted of a formal apology for breaking his promised oath to House Fry and Harenhal along with all its lands plus income made from said lands to ensure the alliance between their houses continued. If that wasn't enough, Walder Fry wanted his daughter Rosalind to marry in the house Tully with Edmir as the chosen man for the job, something Edmir wanted no part of since he felt it was unfair and had no idea what his bride even looked like. For all he knew, his future bride-to-be was a pimply, fat, weird in shape, bucktooth woman with no appeal to his taste in women whatsoever. But Rob had told him it had to be him and even used the damn stone mill incident as a means to make Edmir agree to it. It was not something either man enjoyed since they knew Walder Frey's reputation for being a man who made sure to squeeze someone of every coin owed to him until there was nothing left. Rob knew Walder Frey was going to do the same to him when he had to stand before the elderly man and apologized for breaking the oath to marry one of his daughters. Rob could only hope this didn't come to bite him in the ass later on. King's Landing Training Area while this was happening, Naruto was standing in the training area with a small group of City Watch and Kingsguard as his sparring partners. The reason Naruto was here over sitting on the Iron Throne was simply because he had wanted to keep his own skills sharp in case they were needed. He knew a king had to not only be mentally strong in order to make smart decisions, but physically strong to enforce his power. Which was why Naruto was currently training with his men to push himself and them to the limit. The stronger they were, the better defended King's Landing would be in the long run, and Naruto's skills stayed sharp too. Off to the side, Marjorie Tyrell was watching Naruto train with great interest since this was one of those moments where she could see the battle skill of the man courting her. She had heard of his actions at the Battle of Blackwater Bay. Of him single-handedly cutting through Stannis's bannermen with great strength, speed, and above all else, fury. Something Baratheon always men prided themselves in when in battle and Naruto proved he had that fury within him when fighting throwing the men he was sparing with around like they were children. Marjorie was reminded of the stories of Robert Baratheon and the man's own strength when he fought during both the rebellions. Olena told them to her when she was just a little girl and Mace telling Marjorie about how Robert was a well-muscled man before he let himself go. He could fight with the best of them, smashing his enemy one after the other, and used that to best Rhaegar Targaryen at the Trident. 
And now Naruto showed he had inherited his father's skills, if not talent in that field. Naruto had shown himself skilled not only in the way of the sword, but also in hand-to-hand -hand combat with different styles of fighting. Something he learned over in Essos and Bravos in regards to several fighting masters, who taught how to fight with your fists, and even your feet when required. Naruto was teaching what he learned from his time in Essos and Bravos to his men, who were a little reluctant to learn these things due to them not being considered the way they usually fought. Naruto explained it was for that reason this would benefit them in the long run since the sword, the spear, and the shield were extensions of the body. But what happened if the sword is lost? The shield damaged beyond use? Or the spear was broken in two by a well-timed strike? All you have left is your fists, your feet, and your wits on how to use them when your enemy has the supposed advantage. An enemy, which Naruto explained will think they can kill you easily, will do so even if you begged for mercy, and hoped your pleas would be heard by your possible killer. By using these new set of skills, Naruto explained to his men that they could catch their enemy by surprise, disarm them, and take weapon of the enemy away to use instead if done correctly. It took a few trial and error moments for his men to get the feel for using such skills, but after many hours of intense training almost non-stop with the bruises to show for it, they were finally showing some positive results of their labor. All in all, it was impressive to Marjorie to say the least. And she wasn't the only one who was watching since the hound was there with Braun to see Naruto do the training. They had to admit, the way he moved while odd at first in their eyes, could take down someone armed to the teeth with weapons. Your fighting skills are most impressive your grace. I can see how many believe you are the living breathing embodiment of your house's motto, said Marjorie while she saw him take a nearby towel and wipe the sweat off his upper body. If there is one thing I learned when over in Essos, is to never stop training and keep yourself in top physical form. Otherwise, you risk becoming weak, said Naruto while Marjorie smirked. I don't see you becoming weak your grace. Not after what I have seen just now with your sparring with the City Watch and Kingsguard. You have far too much energy in your body to become weak, said Marjorie while smiling more sultry and it was clear to Naruto she was quite aroused by the sight of seeing his shirtless body. Any further conversation was interrupted when Tyrion Lannister came walking toward them and his face looked grim. Varys needs us in the small council chambers immediately your grace. Something is about to happen. Something very bad, said Tyrion with a great deal of seriousness one did not usually see on the man's face. We'll talk later my lady, said Naruto before rushing to the small council chamber with Tyrion, Braun, and the hound following. Small council chambers moments later. A betrayal? At a wedding, asked Naruto with Varys nodding after telling him what his little birds found out. At the twins to be more specific your grace. A wedding will be held for Ednir Tully and his wife Rosalind Fry. With the ceasefire in effect, Walder Fry feels it is the perfect time to have one and marry off one of his daughters to the new liege lord of Riverrun, said Varys while Naruto grimacing, and thus binding Riverrun and the twins together through marriage. But why would Roose Bolton betray Rob Stark? I know House Bolton isn't the most liked house in the north, but still, betrayal by him seems off, said Naruto while the others nodded. I thought so too your grace, which is why another piece of the puzzle appeared soon after with the communication between House Bolton and House Fry in the form of several message from House Lannister. Namely Cersei Lannister. Your mother, said Varys while Naruto narrowed his eyes. Let me guess, she offered them both a castle's weight in gold each for them betraying Rob Stark and all those loyal to him. Lords and soldiers all, said Naruto with Varys nodding. That and more. With Rob Stark dead, Cersei has promised to back House Bolton in overthrowing what is left of House Stark at Winterfell. Right before he uses his position to force the rest of the North into submission under House Bolton's rule and making him the new Warden of the North by royal decree as it was put in the promised letter, said Varys with Naruto growling. She is Queen Regent. A position that is of a figurehead with no power behind it. And even the title is a generous gift at this point. She has no royal authority to make such a promise to anyone, said Naruto while growling angrily. Still, Roose Bolton believes he will be strong enough to take control of the North with her backing and the additional support of House Fry. Given how he has married one of Walder's daughters, the two houses will work together to get what they want and kill all those who stand in their way. This apology Rob Stark must give in person to Walder Fry and the wedding itself is merely the excuse needed to give all three parties what they want, said Varys while Naruto growled louder, and making the ceasefire pointless. It could be seen as a form of infighting and time when Lannister would be in the clear of all wrongdoing. 
No doubt Roos Bolton and Walder Fry will use this to take Jamie into their custody and squeeze even more gold out of the lion than what Cersei already promised promised. Greedy bastards, said Naruto angrily knowing that was main reason his mother would seek to do this. Not only that, but Naruto knew his mother would use to have her new allies become the muscle needed to get him out of the Iron Throne to put Joffrey there in his place. How do we handle this your grace? If we don't warn Rob Stark, his entire entourage will be destroyed, and Roose Bolton will make his move to consolidate his power in the north with many of the lords along with their men at this wedding being slaughtered. No doubt Roose will use his army to force the other houses and their heirs, if any are left, into submission, and with House Fry backing him, I fear not even the full might of the crown could stop him. Something I suspect your mother already knows by now, said Mace Tyrell with Naruto growled angrily before slamming his hand on the table and making it crack. The hell it can't. I'm going to this wedding, said Naruto with the others in the room looking shocked by this. Your grace, you can't. Not at this time. What if you are killed when this trap is sprung? You have no heirs. If you die, the queen regent will seek to put her second son Joffrey on the iron throne, and I for one do not like the idea of serving a child born from such a sinful manner, said Mace Tyrell with Varys and Tyrion nodding in agreement, but for slightly different reasons. Joffrey was a cruel sadistic child turning into a cruel sadistic man. If he somehow took the Iron Throne via his mother, Tyrion and Varys knew they were deaf within seconds of Joffrey getting the crown on his head. Even worse, his mother would no doubt be the true power behind the Iron Throne, whispering into her son's ear and stroking his ego in the process. She knew as well as anyone who Joffrey well enough to know the boy was much an idiot as he was sadistic in nature. It was easy for the boy's mother to make him do what she wanted and play it off as his own idea so he never questioned any of them. And if Joffrey became king again, Cersei would whisper into his ear once more to assign someone to replace Varys as master of whispers. Someone loyal only to her while being officially loyal in the public eye to Joffrey. And as for Tyrion? Tyrion knew full well that his life would be turned into a living hell before he died and he was pretty sure his sister would find a way to use Shay as the means to make it happen most likely commanding the mountain to do to her what he did to Elia Martell. I am not about to sit on my ass and do nothing while good honorable men are left to be slaughtered when it can be prevented, exclaimed Naruto angrily with his voice shaking the room. No one is saying you shouldn't do something nephew. But this is not one of them. Send a raven to Rob Stark. Warn him of the trap. Warn him of Roose Bolton's treachery, said Tyrion while Naruto's scowl increase and risk it being intercepted by one of Roose Bolton's men? Or the man himself? No. This must be done personally. How many men can King's Landing spare and properly defend itself from an attack, asked Naruto while Varys grimaced. The Kingsguard and City Watch combined total a little over 15,000 your grace. Given the overall population of the city is roughly around 500,000 people, we are sadly, yet secretly unprepared to keep the peace if we sent even half the number with you to stop this disaster from happening, said Varys with Naruto frowning. House Baratheon Bannerman. Those who ran after Stannis lost. They still wish to prove their worth as soldiers of my house, asked Naruto with Varys nodding. Every single one of the remaining 7,500 able men your grace, said Varys with Naruto thinking things over in his head. I need 3,000 Kingsguard ready to come with me to the twins. Varys, send a raven to the bannermen at Storm's End. Inform them they have a chance of redeeming themselves and if they are truly wish to prove their worth, they will answer the call of their house's lord and the king of the seven kingdoms, said Naruto with Varys nodding. Won't such an army make House Stark and House Fry seem like you are coming to attack, asked Tyrion with Naruto smirking. I am doing no such thing uncle. I am merely coming to a wedding and bringing with me an armed escort meant to protect its king during the trip to my destination. Rob Stark has also brought his army. Walder Fry has his own army. It is only fair a king bring his own army during such a delicate time when all sorts of foul creatures are lurking about seeking to target others for their own gain. Correct, replied Naruto with Tyrion smirking back. I almost pity those same foul creatures should they cross your path nephew. Give both Rob Stark and Walder fry my regards. And give one of his more lovely daughters a smack on the ass for me too, said Tyrion while Naruto laughed and gave the shorter man a firm pat on the shoulder. And have Shay kill you? I think not uncle. I can't afford to lose my hand. Especially since you will be running things for me while I'm away. Sandor. You're with me. 
If this goes to shit like I suspect it might, you get to do some more killing, said Naruto before he walked out of the room with the Han right behind him with a grin on his face and Tyrion now pondering the idea of being king, if only in spirit. Take your time, called out Tyrion while smirking slightly and looked at Varys, who looked a little, unhappy by this. Try not to let this go to your head my friend. Your predecessor took his position as Hand of the King very seriously and did a wonderful job during his short time at it. At the very least, don't try to embarrass his grace when he's not around with your antics. I would hate for him to come back and have his uncle for a hand be thrown right into the black cells for any dishonorable behavior you cause, said Varys while Tyrion just smirked further. I know my friend and don't worry. Like Ned Stark, I take this position very seriously when required. At the very least, I get to drink all the wine my body can handle and not worry about being punished for it, commented Tyrion before he walked out of the room. I almost feel bad for the winemakers responsible for making the wine. How someone so physically small can drink so much wine without killing themselves in the process baffles me to no end, remarked Varys to Mace Tyrell, who let out a small laugh. That's it for this reading. Hit like and subscribe for a free ticket pass going to the different worlds of anime fanfiction. Looking forward to having you on board again.